delicious. Oh. Pretty mouth. Okay. Here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, oh. Join me at seven on GB News, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, it's 3pm. Welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Today, as the Prime Minister promises to bring in a new law to exonerate hundreds of post office branch managers wrongly convicted, in a few minutes I'll be joined by a man who was hired to investigate complaints about the faulty horizon system, but astonishingly, when he found that there were in fact problems with it, the post office simply got rid of him. Next up, Rishi Sunak is getting ready for a battle with Tory MPs once again over the Rwanda bill, with one influential former minister saying the plan simply doesn't work. And there's news of a dramatic night in the Red Sea, where the Royal Navy destroyed multiple attack drones from Iranian-backed Houthis. And the UK continues to be in the grip of a cold snap, while many places are still being affected, of course, by floods. And that's all coming next in your next hour. As usual, I want to hear from you. A simply astonishing interview coming up with Ian Henderson, hired by the post office to look into Horizon, but when he came up with the wrong information, they simply gave him the chop. This scandal rolls on and on and on. I was in PMQs earlier today. A political solution, solution seems to be in place, but I want to hear from you as ever. Email me your, your views, gbviews at gbnews.com. What do you make of this scandal? Is it the worst thing you've ever seen in British political history? But now it's time for the news headlines with Sam Francis. Martin, thank you very much. Good afternoon from the GB Newsroom. I'm Sam Francis. The headlines at three. Post office workers caught up in the Horizon IT scandal could have their names cleared by the end of this year. Postal Services Minister Kevin Hollinrake says new legislation to exonerate sub-postmasters in England and Wales will be introduced within weeks. There'll also be an upfront payment of £75,000 to compensate those who were jailed or bankrupted as a result of flawed computer software. Mr Hollenrake says the victims will get the justice they deserve. We intend to bring forward legislation as soon as we can to overturn the convictions of all those convicted in England or Wales on the basis of post office evidence given during the Horizon scandal. 
The Government will, in the coming days, consider whether to include the small number of cases that have already been considered by the appeal courts and the convictions upheld. Earlier, Vijay Parekh spoke to GB News. He's one of the victims of the post office scandal. All the people who are involved in this get the same treatment we have had, all the uh, convicted uh, postmasters, and let them feel how we felt. We've done nothing and we've been in prison. They have done something, so they need to be in prison for the reason what they've done. Meanwhile, the Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, says that Rishi Sunak has been caught red-handed opposing his own Rwanda plan. It comes as the Prime Minister is bracing for a common showdown over his flagship scheme after being warned by some Conservative MPs that it won't work unless it's significantly strengthened. During the first Prime Minister's questions of 2024, Keir Starmer referenced reports that Rishi Sunak had wanted to scale back the government's Rwanda scheme when he was Chancellor. £400 million of taxpayer money down the drain. No one sent to Rwanda, small boats still coming. It's hardly a surprise he wanted to scrap the scheme when he was trying to sneak in as Tory leader. But he's been caught red-handed opposing the very thing that he's now made his flagship policy. Which member should we listen to? The one before us today or the one who used to believe in something? But the Prime Minister fought back and accused Labour of being against any deterrent. You do need to have an effective deterrence to finally solve this problem. In fact, the National Crime Agency agree that you need, in their words, an effective removals and deterrence agreement. And that's why, after becoming Prime Minister, I negotiated a new deal with Albania, thanks to which we have seen a 93% drop in illegal arrivals from Albania. That's how Australia stopped the boats. That's why Italy, Germany and Austria are all looking at similar schemes. He's the only one who's opposed to a proper deterrent. Well, today we've heard that half of child sexual abuse cases reported to police in 2022 were crimes committed by children. That's according to data gathered by police in England and Wales. Half of the offences involved a child aged 10 to 17 as a suspect or perpetrator in what the force is calling a growing and concerning trend. The figures are up from a third in 2013. Elsewhere, violence is erupting on the streets of Ecuador with police checkpoints and helicopters patrolling major cities. Ecuador's president, Daniel Noboa, has declared a state of emergency following the prison escape of one of the country's most notorious gang bosses. Yesterday, hooded gunmen burst into a live television studio. They were waving guns and wearing masks. Police have so far confirmed they've arrested 13. Here in the UK, the estimated cost of building HS2 between London and Birmingham has soared to as much as £66.6 billion. The chairman of the project, Sir John Thompson, has told MPs the increase is due to original budgets being too low, changes to the scope in the project, poor delivery and inflation. In 2013, the project was estimated to cost £37.5 billion for the entire planned network, including the now scrapped sections from Birmingham to Manchester and Leeds. Well, the world's, world's first ever pothole preventing robot is set to hit the roads in Hertfordshire after a successful test rollout. The machine, called Eris Prevent, can identify and classify potholes using artificial intelligence. It can then automatically fill them up to keep water out, which would otherwise sweep through the surface, uh, causing more damage for drivers. If, if successful, the machine could save time and money to identify the potholes and cause the disruption. That we call that are caused to motorists. And a drawing of Queen Victoria is just one of among over 1,700 missing objects from museums across England. The list of misplaced items has been collated by galleries and museums over the last 20 years. The National Portrait Gallery says it has 45 missing items, while the Victoria and Albert Museum says it has more than 180 missing artefacts. That's the latest from the GB Newsroom. For more, we're on TV, on digital radio and on your smart speaker. Just say play GB News. Now, though, it's back to Martin in Westminster.
Thank you, Sam. Now, we start with the latest dramatic developments in the post office scandal. And there's great news for the hundreds of people who were wrongly convicted. Rishi Sunak has confirmed the government will bring in a new law to exonerate the branch managers caught up in the Horizon IT scandal. I'm joined now in our Westminster studio by our political editor, Christopher Hope. Chris, um, a lively PMQ today, but um, Rishi Sunak appears to have done the right thing, as you predicted yesterday in this very studio. Yeah, we got wind at GB News there was going to be some form of legislation to quash these convictions. I mean, the numbers are quite interesting. They're coming out now. Just 10% of the postmasters convicted have had their convictions mm. quashed. 980, yeah. 93 quashed, so one in 10. And that's just too slow, I think, um, for, for politics. The inquiry ongoing into this scandal is meant to report back in 2022. It's now 2024. And I think, in a sense, politics has just bubbled up uh, and they can't really wait any longer for this inquiry, which was due to report at least, uh, just well, well over a year ago. Um, the PM said in PMQ, didn't he, just then, that they, the people will be, will be swiftly exonerated and compensated, mm. £75,000 each for those who took action against Post Office Limited. He called it one of the greatest miscarriages of justice, of justice in our nation's history, mm. which is pretty, saying something in Parliament. Um, there's a risk here to the government because they're going to exonerate all of yes. the convicted post office, uh, uh, office uh, sub postmasters. Now, Kevin Hollerake, who's the, uh, the post office minister, he said that, that there will be an unknown number of people within that who should be convicted. Mm. But the government's going to get everyone to sign a piece of paper to say, I did not take any money illegally. And if it's found after the event that they did find take money illegally, then they can be prosecuted for fraud. So there's, that's the kind of cover for securing and protecting public money. So, so initially there'll be a blanket exoneration, but what, would then would they have to go through each case on a case-by-case -case basis to, to check? No, I think you just straight off the board, all exonerated. But if evidence came to light after the event, police could then investigate and look back and say, well, you've signed a piece of paper. Mm. Evidence suggests you did take money. We'll take action. So it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a good result because one would imagine it could, we could be three quarters of those, more than that, far more than that, probably, who are innocent. But, Duncan, you're a former um, uh, uh, sub-postmaster, aren't you? You know all about the, the issue here. Yeah, I mean, I've followed this now. It's extraordinary, what, ten or so days since the ITV drama aired in almost disbelief. But, of course, ever since I was elected in 2019, I've been campaigning endlessly on this because it has a very personal meaning to me. I was a sub-postmaster from 2014 to 2019, and in 2015, um, the branch that I was a sub-postmaster of, Budgeons of Aylsham, was Post Office of the Year, can you <laughs> believe? So this has been a very personal um, mission. Uh, obviously, I've had uh, constituents caught up with this as well. But, you know, we are finally, as I said uh, at the post office uh, question just before I came over here, one of the things we still don't know is how much money was taken by the post office unlawfully from all of these people. We now think that there are well over 3,000 people, nearly 4,000 people. Well, even on an average figure of sort of 15,000 each, we're talking millions and millions and millions of pounds which was taken unlawfully. And I've asked... Um, the minister to actually go back to the post office. Let's publish that number mm. so people can Gosh. see on an industrial scale how big that number is. One thing we do know, Duncan, in terms of the numbers, is that Fujitsu is worth almost 24 billion quid, and over the past decade it's been awarded almost 200 public contracts to the approximate value of 6.7 billion quid. They've got deep pockets, they're still an, in the employment of the government, surely they're the ones to foot the bill for any compensation claims. Six times I have in Parliament said we need to do more to investigate Fujitsu. Six times. And thankfully now we are hearing all about this, that uh, they will be looked at. I mean, that scene when in the second episode of the drama, when a sub-postmaster union official went into this sort of underground dungeon in Fujitsu and was told, oh yes, we can totally change the branch balances for sub-postmasters and they never know that we've been into their accounts it was absolutely mm. shocking. And that, you know, that has just totally blown the doors off this whole issue. We just, you can't place any reliance at all on what we're now told by the post office. Is there an argument for terminating their contracts or, you know, at least postponing them, saying until you sort this out? Then you, I mean, look, I, I'll try and make it simple. Like, if, if you're a fish and chip shop and your potato supplier is giving you rotten potatoes, you'd get rid of them. <laughs> Sure, but you can go and buy your potatoes probably from another supplier mm. reasonably easily. The difficulty with this, we are talking about multi-billion pound 
um, IT companies, there aren't many of those around, and so the specialisms to be able to write the software, um, I agree entirely with you. That's why I've been saying they should be investigated. I think we just have to realise how intricate and how specialist this uh, company is mm. and how you can't just necessarily cancel contracts left, right and centre because they are, in, they are part of sort of so many systems around the country, let alone the world. OK, Duncan, Chris, stick around. Um, let's speak now to a, a man who told the post office that there were issues with their Horizon system many years ago. And I'm joined now by Ian Henderson, who's the co-founder of Second Sight, which is a forensic accountant's company. Thanks for joining us on GB News, Ian. Your story is astonishing. Can you please talk us through it? Yeah, we were appointed by um, a group of MPs in 2012 to independently investigate concerns about uh, Horizon. Um, and we issued our report, which I think shocked many people, shocked MPs, and led to the formation of a mediation working group because uh, we were dealing with applications from about 140 sub-postmasters who felt that their concerns had not been properly um, or been taken seriously. Uh, and it was that mediation sort of working group that was the first step in getting some form of redress for individual sub-postmasters. And you came up with the information which the post office didn't like. You raised concerns. They didn't like the sound of those concerns and they simply terminated your employment. Is that correct? They terminated our, our contracts and they also terminated their support for the mediation sort of working group. Um, so it was, it was a bit of a double whammy, which was unfortunate uh, for, for sub postmasters and ultimately probably not for, in the best interest of post office either. And this was in 2015. It's now 2023. Yes. Eight our, years. Our work starts it started in 2012. We continued working for post office and, and on behalf of, uh, well, we were appointed by members of parliament um, and we worked for about sort of three years. And matters all came to a head in 2015. And by then we had substantially issued about 140 reports on individual cases affecting sub postmasters. So 140 clear cases of evidence eight years ago the post office got the information which they'd asked for, they'd paid for, they'd employed you to provide. When you gave it, they didn't like what they heard, and so they got rid of you. This is utterly scandalous. I think that was the view of uh, many MPs and, and certainly many of the participants in, in the mediation working group. I remember talking to Alan Bates at the time, who, who formed the Justice for Sub Postmasters Alliance, and he, he regarded that the inevitable consequence of the withdrawal of post office from supporting that scheme was he had no option then but to head for, for litigation. And, and he rapidly moved over a period of two or three years towards the, the group litigation order, which was a, a, a civil claim on behalf of, I think it was 555 former sub-postmasters against post office. And so, Mr. Henderson, having uncovered um, your irregularities in Horizon, which, of course, is a product of Fujitsu, now we move towards what should have been happening years ago, if your evidence had been heeded at any rate, and that is looking to restore the good names, the good, the good law, and also heading towards compensation for those affected. Do you think that bill should be footed by Fujitsu? I, I think that's a, a question for post office to, to, to answer. I, I mean, certainly, um, you know, post office may well be considering their own position and, and their relationship with, with Fujitsu. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't aware in detail of the contractual sort of relationships, and I can't really sort of comment on potential liabilities. But in, in terms of your experience of working with the post office, I mean, it's, they're already been pulled out of any right to take part in any of the consultation in terms of the legal issues moving forward. <coughs> From what you're saying, that their, their, their kind of good faith, their good name, that would stand up. They can't be trusted. Well, post office resisted us from from day one. They 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 in effect had our appointment <coughs> imposed upon them by members of parliament. But thank goodness for um, strong-willed, independently-minded members of parliament um, like um, Dame's 
Uh, uh, Teresa, Teresa and, and um, yes, and 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 Nadim Sahawi and others who really challenged um, uh, post office and, um, um, and and did a great deal to uh, to move this forward. And have you had any? I mean, you've been watching this scandal and role since the ITV drama. You obviously know about this from your own involvement. Has this just seemed to you like an accident in slow motion? Did you know this was coming? You sensed this was coming? You saw the injustice from inside the system. It's taken so long to come to the public mind now. How are you feeling about this very, very pregnant pause between your findings and this actual resolution now, eight whole years later, after you presented? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, well, the second site has, has lived with this for certainly the, the, the last 10 years. Um, and despite um, representations to members of parliament and, and, and so on, um, it is quite astonishing the impact that um, the Mr Bates v the Post Office, um, written by Gwyneth Hughes, the, the drama, the, the impact has been absolutely astonishing. I don't think anybody could have, uh, could have predicted that the drama could have had the effect that it has. It's, it's totally changed um, the position of government, the position of post office. I, I, I think it's, it's probably the most dramatic um, drama uh, that I've ever come across. I hope they win and, a BAFTA. And very quickly, Ian, I think more than a BAFTA, what about a knighthood for Alan Bates? We're seeing, we're seeing, we're seeing uh, knighthoods and CBEs potentially being stripped away from people. What about a knighthood for Mr Bates? Surely that would get a huge, huge public vote. I'm sure, I'm sure it would. I mean, Alan Bates has been absolutely outstanding and amazing throughout... We've had the privilege of, of working quite closely with him. Certainly, he was a stalwart on the mediation sort of working group. If anybody des deserves a public award and recognition for, for this work, it must be Alan Bates, and he'd certainly have the support of Second Sight. Thank you very much, Ian Henderson, the co-founder of Second Sight, for joining us. I'm still joined in the studio by Duncan and Chris. Duncan, what's your reaction to um, astonishing revelations that they knew about this for over eight years, did nothing? <laughs> Yes, well, it is extraordinary. I mean, it just sounds as though give us the answer and then when they got it, they uh, decided to dismiss it. And you saw a lot of that play out in the drama mm -hmm. uh, over the last... Uh over the last uh, four days when it was on television. Um, it is absolutely incredible. And I think that goes very much to the heart of the inquiry that's still going on. And at the end of it, of course, we're not really talking about it a lot at the moment, but the Met had decided to press into some criminal investigations. Mm. Who knew what within Fujitsu and also the post mm. office? And those investigations... So, as I've said just now in Parliament before I came here, we are probably only halfway through mm. the journey and what a half we've already had, mm. there is going to be an awful lot more to go with this. And when we start to find out, you know, people actually being prosecuted and investigated for what they knew, why they lied about it, what they covered up, as mm. Mr Henderson has basically just alluded to, mm. it is going to get even deeper. Every stone we are unturning, we are finding more and more. Chris, um, just a mind-blowing saga, but do you think um, the Conservatives have been swift to act on this? I mean, Rishi Sunak today pledged this, this exoneration pretty quickly mm. in, in the whole huge sprawling magnitude of this case, at least as we approach the, this kind of resolution stage, he acted swiftly. Well, they have been. I mean, I think in government, the problem they've got in government is there's all sorts of problems they could be dealing with. Look at the rack co concrete <clears throat> last, last uh, summer. Now, that went through two, three decades of not being replaced, the aerated concrete, until there was a problem with the school last summer. Suddenly, suddenly they took action. I think, to be fair to ministers, they have, they have got, they've only got limited things they can do in the time allowed financially and the rest of it. And I think this programme last week um, allowed people to be able to put yourself on the side of the post postmasters and see in their real in the, how it was for them. Yeah. But Duggan, you met some of the key figures. You met Paula Benels, didn't you? And, yeah. and how did you find her when you met her? She now lost her, losing her CBE. I should say, she's handing it back. Yes, I'd called for that over the last few days. I'm very pleased to see that that's happened. It was the right thing to yeah. do. Yeah, I met her in 2016 on a sub postmasters training course. Somewhat ironically, seen as a bit of a pin up for the post office because we were running a sub post <coughs> office and a post office in the back of a budgeon store. Mm. It was a wonderful sort of... Uh, it was a large budgeon store, so we were seen as a real professional corporate operators of the post office, just what Paula Venels wanted to see. And I got the impression just at that meeting that actually they weren't interested in the little people, mm. you know, the, sub, the little post offices attached to a cafe, exactly what you saw Joe Hamilton having. 
And that goes to the heart of this, doesn't it? The, the little people they weren't interested in. OK, superb stuff. Duncan Baker, Conservative MP, thank you. And former Postmaster, thanks for your insight, Chris Hope. Always a pleasure. We have to move on. Now, as we said, it was the first Prime Minister's questions of the year, and that took place this lunchtime. In fact, I was there. And Lee Anderson asked the first question, and as you'd expect, he made sure the session started with a bang with a question about Sir Ed Davey. This is the same Liberal Democrat leader who in the past has called for the resignation of over 30 prominent people in this country who have made mistakes in their jobs. So does the Prime Minister agree with me that the leader of the Lib Dems should take his own advice and start by clearing his desk, clear his diary and clear off? Yeah, about as little as a brick to the face. And we'll have lots more on this huge story throughout the show. And there's plenty of coverage on our website, gbnews.com. And you've helped to make it the fastest growing national news website in the country. So thank you very much. Now, the controversial Rwanda bill is back in the Commons next Tuesday. And Rishi Sunak is braced for yet another battle with the right wing of his party. And the other one, I would expect. <laughs> I'm Austin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests, and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much.
Welcome back. It's 3.27. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, later this hour, we'll get reaction to Donald Trump's threat that there will be bedlam if he's not given immunity from prosecution. I don't think there'll be bedlam, whatever happens. Anyway, Rishi Sunak is braced for a Commons showdown over his Rwanda plan after being warned by Tory MPs that the proposal won't work unless it's significantly beefed up. A large number of right-wing Conservatives are backing amendments to the bill aimed at effectively ignoring international law. Well, let's cross now to Downing Street and speak to our political correspondent, Catherine Forster. Catherine, welcome to the show. I gave you a little wave earlier on in PMQs. It's quite lively, wasn't it? And in fact, <laughs> this very topic came up. Starmer was steaming into Rishi, um, digging up dirt about his former life where he opposed, he says, Rwanda as Chancellor. What happened next? Yes, he did. Um, it was quite clever, actually, wasn't it? Because mm. Keir, Keir Starmer began by talking about an MP who'd had reservations about Rwanda, who thought it was a gimmick, that worried about the cost, that thought it didn't work, and said, you know, who is this MP? And, of course, it was allegedly um, Rishi Sunak, the now Prime Minister, when as Chancellor, he, according to the papers now, uh, Downing Street are saying they haven't seen these documents, um, but plenty of people have, revealed that when he was Chancellor, he had all these doubts and reservations about the Rwanda scheme. So Sir Keir Starmer used this um, to great effect in Prime Minister's questions, didn't he? Rishi Sunak saying, no, 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 I absolutely <coughs> realise that this is important, this is how we're going to do it. Um, um, but, of course, it does raise doubts, doesn't it? And he's going to have a battle on his hands next week because the safety of Rwanda bill is coming back to Parliament for the second time next Tuesday and Wednesday. And there's going to be another row. We had a row before Christmas. In the end, all the rebels stood down. Nobody actively voted against the bill. But will that happen this time because overnight about 30 Tory MPs on the right of the party have published these amendments which as you say are to toughen up the bill um, to make it explicit that there'll be no sort of pyjama injunctions from European courts that they won't be able to block us doing what we want also to tighten who might be able to appeal against going um, to basically people who are unfit to fly like heavily pregnant women now people like Danny Kruger like Ian Duncan Smith like Bill Cash like Robert Jenrick the former immigration minister feel that these adjustments are absolutely critical if this bill is to have a chance of succeeding however on the other side of the party, about 100 One Nation MPs on the left of the Tory party, um, they feel that they can just about live with the bill as it is, but if it goes an inch further, that will be an inch too far. So, um, uh, Sir Robert Buckland, who's former Justice Secretary, this morning saying that these new amendments being proposed have gone too far and that as it is, he's not that happy about the existing bill as it stands. So real problems ahead next week for Rishi Sunak. They need to try to find a way through this to get it through the Commons, to get it through the Lords, where, let's face it, it's going to have an almighty battle, and then hopefully to get people on flights to Rwanda in the spring. That's all always still what Rishi Sunak is pinning his hopes on, but um, real doubts as to whether it will ever happen. OK, Catherine Forster, live from Downing Street. Here we go again. It's like Brexit. It's too, too lame for the right and too beefy for the left. It's the same old story. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and four o'clock. I'll have the full story from a dramatic night in the Red Sea where HMS Diamond destroyed multiple attack drones from Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Sam Francis. Martin, thank you. Good afternoon. From the GB Newsroom, I'm Sam Francis. The headlines at 3.30. All the people who are involved in this get the same treatment we have had, all this uh, convicted uh, postmasters, and let them feel how we felt. We've done nothing and we've been in prison. They have done something, so they need to be in prison for the reason what they've done.
Well, that was one of the victims speaking there from the post office scandal. He was caught up in that Horizon IT scandal, uh, among many others who will have their convictions overturned just by signing one document. That comes as the Postal Services Minister, Kevin Hollenrake, says that new emergency legislation may take some weeks to deliver, but he insists it is a priority for the government. There will also be an upfront payment of £75,000 to compensate the sub-postmasters who were jailed or bankrupted as a result of flawed computer software. Meanwhile, the Defence Secretary says the UK has helped to repel the largest ever attack by Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in the Red Sea. Overnight, HMS Diamond, along with the US, successfully destroyed multiple attack drones. No crew on the warship have been injured and they haven't suffered any damage. Grant Shapps says the attacks are completely unacceptable and warned there will be consequences. The Yemeni militants have been targeting ships in support of Hamas in its war with Israel. And violence is erupting on the streets of Ecuador with police checkpoints and helicopters patrolling major cities. Ecuador's president, Daniel Noboa, has declared a state of emergency following the prison escape of one of the country's most notorious drug gang bosses. Yesterday, hooded gunmen burst live into a television studio waving guns and wearing masks. Police say they have arrested 13 so far. And the estimated cost of building HS2 here in the UK, the route between London and Birmingham, has soared to as much as £66.6 .6 billion. The chairman of the project, Sir John Thompson, told MPs the increase is due to the original budget being too low, changes to the scope of the project, poor delivery and inflation. And for more, you can get uh, lots of stories on our website, gbnews.com. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2723 and €1.1626. The price of gold is £1,593.82 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,656 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Sam. Now, Donald Trump has warned there will be bedlam in the United States if he's not given legal immunity from prosecution. The former president was in an appeals court yesterday over claims that he is immune from criminal charges for trying to overturn the 2020 presidential election result. And Trump has warned that he might prosecute Joe Biden if he beats him in this November's presidential election. So chaos as usual in American politics. And to discuss this, I'm joined by the US political journalist Laurie Laird. Laurie, welcome to the show. Always a Good pleasure. Good afternoon. Astonishing scenes yesterday, just when you think it can't get any more insane in American politics, Trump goes nuclear. This time, his attorney yesterday making the case that he couldn't be prosecuted even as president if he ordered the murder of an opponent by the military. What Can you try and make us make sense of this, please, Laurie? In short, I don't think I can. It is so crazy. We're actually losing the language to discuss what is happening in American politics. We started with all of these Trump cases saying this is historic. And remember when he would drive down to the courthouse when he was in New York and there were drones following him historic. We are use, losing language. Clearly, the U.S. Constitution was not prepared for Donald Trump. But this is an interesting legal question. Can mm. you be prosecuted when you are holding the office of the presidency? And I think it is important that judges consider this question. Now, this was a three-person judicial panel that will consider this. Ordinarily, courts can take a while to issue a judgment. The, the judges will be aware that there is a degree of urgency to this, but we don't know when the, the ruling will come down. You can guarantee whichever side loses this one, there will be a, an appeal. So we won't see the answer to this for some months yet.
Anne Laurie, this has been called a tit for tat um, prosecution's case. Um, quite simply, they're trying to stop Trump any which way they can via the courts, um, even being on the Republican primary ticket. So this is Trump basically saying, well, I can play at that game too. And if I win, I'm going to come for you. Presumably, that's to try and stop them doing this. But will it work or will it inflame tensions even further? Look, at the moment, every time Trump is accused of something, every time there is a court case, it helps his ratings. It also helps his, his his pursuit of money. Now, a lot of the big donors have deserted Donald Trump, and Nikki Haley, who is a... a, a, a a rival for the Republican nomination is bringing in some big donors. But in terms of retail politics, every time Trump is before a court, small donations from his fan base, maybe a smaller fan base or a diminishing fan base, but Donald Trump fans are very deep, very enthusiastic about their support. And this does bring in some money. One thing that surprises me, though, as well as Donald Trump does every time he's in front of a courthouse, he is still spending a lot of money and a lot of time in Iowa. The Iowa caucuses mm. are less than a week away. They take place next Monday. And for a man who has such a big lead, I am surprised at how much time and money Donald Trump is throwing into Iowa. He's doing a town hall meeting there tonight. Uh, Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis are also are doing a debate tonight. Remember, Donald Trump has not engaged in any debate with his rivals. But Donald Trump, for all of his lead, spending a lot of time in Iowa. And it's interesting because none of this seems to have any impact on his on his polling. In fact, it seems to go up. And it makes you wonder, you know, is the definition of insanity repeating the same thing and expecting a different <laughs> outcome? When will the Biden camp realise it simply pings off his armour? Well, I do think something was different about this hearing yesterday. There were fewer Trump supporters around, fewer crowds. And in fact, the coverage was much different than when we first started to see Donald Trump in a courtroom. So I think that the magic of Donald Trump uh, as, as, as someone being persecuted by the courts, I think that is starting to wear off a bit. I think that he's probably going to have to do a little bit more than present himself as a victim as we go forward. But, you know, one thing we talk about over and over is we talk about this rematch of Trump versus Biden. I think that's a probable matchup, but I don't think that we should rule out neither of these men being on the ticket. Donald Trump, because of all of his legal problems, it, there's a chance that he may not be able to take up the nomination. I do think the nomination is his for the asking, and Joe Biden, the obvious problems, where he could not be on the ticket either. So I think we have to start thinking about this. It's likely we'll see Trump-Biden, but it's not a, a foregone conclusion. OK, well, that election, the greatest show on earth, is November the 5th, which is in Britain, of course. It's fireworks night, and it certainly will be fireworks. It's going to be one <laughs> to watch. Laurie Laird, US political journalist, thank you for joining us on GB News. Superb stuff. I think American politics is absolutely fascinating. It's one of the few things on earth that makes British politics look sane. Now, the Met Office has issued an amber cold health alert for the southwest of England. And that's not the only part of the UK that's been hit by a cold snap. I fell asleep last night with my electric blanket on. I'm Austin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. Wake up to the headlines with headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes a, here comes a train. <laughs> Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Carson, this Saturday night showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday night showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 3.44. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. At 4 o'clock, I have some great news for hundreds of victims of the post office scandal. But now, what's happening in the Red Sea? It's all heating up after the UK and the US fought back against the largest ever attack by Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. Defence Secretary Grant Schapp says the Royal Navy Air Defence Destroyer HMS Diamond shot down multiple attack drones heading for commercial vessels. Well, joining me now is our home and security editor, Mark White. Mark, tensions rising in the Red Sea. Um, this, is this Britain getting dragged inexorably into a war in the Middle East? I think it certainly looks increasingly likely that there will be some kind of military action at some point against these Houthi rebels in Yemen itself. So far, what we've seen are defensive actions that are taking place out in the Red Sea to protect both commercial shipping and those naval assets themselves from attacks from these drones and missiles. Now, it was a very significant attack that was launched last night. Uh, 18 attack drones that were launched by Houthi rebels, as well as three missiles. And they were launched in the direction not just of commercial shipping out in the Red Sea, but off uh, HMS Diamond itself, that Type 45 air defence uh, destroyer. It had to take out seven of these uh, attack drones. Uh, other attack drones and missiles were taken out by... Uh, F-A-18 fighter jets from the uh, USS uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, the supercarrier for the US out in the Red Sea, and three of the supporting vessels uh, in that carrier strike group that were involved in taking out uh, these attack drones and these missiles. We've been hearing from the Defence Secretary, Grant Shapps Martin, uh, who has issued another warning uh, to the Houthi rebels, suggesting that action will take place if they persist have, I'm afraid, failed to heed the warnings issued on the 3rd of January. We seem to see a drop-off after that. 
by a number of different countries, including the UK and the US, uh, for them to stop and to cease this action. Uh, but I'm afraid uh, last night proved they really are not listening. If this doesn't stop, uh, then action will be taken. So I'm afraid that I suppose the simplest thing is to say, watch this space. Now, quite what that action will be and when it will take place, we don't know. We probably won't know until any of these strikes have actually happened. Uh, in terms of our capability uh, to help the US, for instance, in launching strikes, well, those ships, those uh, three naval vessels that are going to be in the Red Sea, we've got HMS Richmond, a Type 23 frigate that's just left Gibraltar this afternoon heading uh, for the Red Sea. We've got HMS Lancaster, another Type 23 frigate in the Red Sea along with HMS Diamond. None of these ships really have land attack capabilities. I mean, they can do it uh, to an extent via their onboard helicopters and they've got uh, naval guns, uh, but that's not what they would employ. It would be missile strikes that you're looking at uh, going after the Houthi uh, launching infrastructure. So it might be that they have to call on the services of uh, a British naval attack submarine that have these uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles, it would be land attack missiles, or indeed they could call on the services of the RAF, the typhoons that are based uh, normally up in Cyprus there, could be moved down to the likes of Djibouti near Yemen to assist the Americans if they uh, decide to do that. As I say, no firm decision that we're aware of has been made as yet, but Grant Sharps there saying, uh, watch this space. We'll say it's, it's a hugely significant and important shipping channel, the Red Sea. Um, millions and millions of pounds worth of goods coming towards the UK from that area. And, of course, if that's crippled back, then, of course, we're going to see more spiralling costs adding to inflation. So this economically is a significant strategic thing we must get involved in. Yeah, I mean, it's easy for people, of course, in the UK perhaps to lose sight of events taking place uh, out in the Red Sea, the Suez Canal, and not really think that that's something that should concern them too much, but it absolutely does. It hikes up the prices of, of course, oil and gas, but also those consumer goods that you buy in the supermarkets and uh, the department stores as well, because that route... Uh, for uh, massive amounts of cargo uh, from Asia uh, to the West is normally up through uh, the Suez Canal. To go down through the, uh, the, the south of the continent of Africa around the Cape of Good Hope adds about another 10 days to the journey. And as you say, Martin, quite rightly, that then has a direct impact on the prices that the everyday consumer in this country and other Western countries will have to face. OK, thank you for that update, Mark White, our Home and Security Editor. Now, as Brits are known for our love of weather talk, and this week there's definitely lots of that chat about because the Met Office have issued an amber cold health alert for the southwest of England following Storm Henk last week. Over 100 flood warnings are currently in place, and an Arctic blast is set to make the country even colder. Let's cross now to Tewkesbury in Gloucestershire in West, and our West Midlands reporter, Jack Carson. Jack, you're out there once again freezing your what's it's off. What's the latest? <laughs> Yeah, well, my cheeks are certainly feeling it uh, this afternoon, Martin. But as you can probably see behind me, the thing here about Tewkesbury, of course, when it flooded um, last week and in the past couple of weeks, a lot of that flood water is still really being quite stubborn. Now, we know the Environment Agency warned that that flood water um, after the aftermath of Storm Henk would be around um, in some places for some time. And you can certainly see from behind me um, with this car park here, how it's still very much uh, flooded and that water level not really reducing at a significant pace, of course, we did really feel the impact of the flooding. Parts of the River Severn also then joined with the River Avon here, which is why um, there's that, that both those big volumes of water coming together um, meant that there was no other option for that water, no other place for that water to go, um, which put a lot of this place underwater as well. Now, there are still flood warnings in place here uh, for parts of the River Severn in Tewkesbury, but also 93 flood warnings still in place uh, across the country. You then combine that with the cold snap, and you can certainly feel how 
how lots of those households who have been struggling with flood water are now facing um, another problem. I mean, just an example of what the kind of uh, the mix of those two is. When I was here this morning, you could see that the, there was a very thin layer of ice over the top of the of some of the flood water, which of course is making. Um, you know, some of that cleanup operation um, even harder. And, and the cold snap certainly uh, still looks like it's very much still going to be on the way because we do have um, this kind of band of high pressure, um, this unsettled weather coming from the south uh, over the course uh, of the next seven days. Now, temperatures here in Gloucestershire are already below average, the Met Office say, for this time of year. And so that band of high pressure coming in, joining obviously with that pressure that's coming down from the north as well, could mean that this uh, time next week we see around five centimetres of snow here down south. The Met Office say there could be uh, up to 10 centimetres of snow further north as well. So um, of course the people here um, hoping that they can get back their lives back to normal uh, with the impact of, of this flooding but more disruption in snow could well be on the way. OK Jack Colson once again up to your neck in it. Got your waders on there in Tewkesbury. Thanks for joining us. Now quickly lots of you have been getting in touch with your thoughts on the post office scandal. Simon says this Fujitsu is the world's sixth largest IT provider with 125,000 employees and a turnover in the billions each year. They have made mistakes with the Horizon system and should be made to pay all of the costs and compensation in relation to this scandal. Now, a lot of people, a lot of people will agree with that, and in fact, those are the conversations that were raised today at Prime Minister's Question Time. Those are the questions we're going to continue to raise here on GB News this afternoon, holding people to account. It's astonishing. It's taken all these years for this to come to account. We spoke to a guest earlier on who, who said this was known about for many, many years, but last we approach some form of resolution. OK, stick with us. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. And as I said, we will carry on the pressure on the post office scandal after this, speaking to more MPs, asking for them, why were they asleep at the wheel as this scandal rolled on? I'm Martin Daubney on GB News. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again, it's Aidan McKibben here from the Met Office with the GB News forecast. It's feeling cold out there today. There are some sunny skies around, but otherwise a lot of cloud is covering the country, especially across northeastern parts. High pressure currently driving east to northeasterly winds in across the UK. Feeling cold in that wind despite the sunshine in the south and a lot of cloud elsewhere will bring some spots of rain and drizzle to Wales, northern and eastern England, southern Scotland. That will tend to fade through the night. Clear skies in the south will lead to a frost in many places, although there will be some patchy cloud cover developing. Minus one to minus two Celsius in the south, a frost also likely for western Scotland under clear spells. But elsewhere where we've got the cloud, it's going to be a frost-free start to Thursday. Temperatures of 4 to 6 Celsius across East Wales into the Midlands, Eastern England, Southern and Eastern Scotland. We've got less of a wind on Thursday, so perhaps not feeling quite as cold in the south. We've got a sunny start in the south, but increasingly the cloud builds from the northeast, keeping the sunshine towards the far southwest, increasing sunshine across central and western Scotland. Otherwise, a lot of cloud, but fewer showers around compared with today. Into Friday, a frosty start for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Clear skies here, generally cloudy elsewhere. And into the weekend, a big change in the weather comes along as Arctic winds arrive with snow showers for Scotland. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. 
Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, it's 4pm and welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Now there's great news today for hundreds of post office branch managers wrongly convicted because the Prime Ministers promised to bring in a new law to exonerate them, as Chris Hope said on this show yesterday. Rishi Sunak is getting ready for a battle with Tory MPs over the Rwanda bill, with one influential former minister saying the plan, quote, simply does and work. And the Home Office halted plans to house hundreds of migrants in luxury apartments in Farnborough and we'll be speaking to a resident and that's all coming up in your next hour. So as usual, I want to hear from you. Email me your views, gbviews at gbnews.com. We've had hundreds of comments in already on the post office scandal and the interview we'll have shortly with the resident in Farnborough. The local MP says that the luxury apartments for asylum seekers has been, quote, paused. But we're not hearing that from our sources on the ground. That's coming up in your next hour. But before that, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you and hello to you. Well, the top story, as you've been hearing, post office workers caught up in the Horizon IT scandal could have their names cleared by the end of this year. Postal Services Minister Kevin Hollenrake said today new legislation to exonerate sub-postmasters and mistresses in England and Wales will be introduced within weeks. There'll also be an upfront payment of £75,000 to compensate the sub-postmasters and mistresses who were jailed or bankrupt corrupted as a result of the flawed computer software that made it look like money had been missing. Mr Hollenrake said victims will get the justice they deserve.
intend to bring forward legislation as soon as we can to overturn the convictions of all those convicted in England or Wales on the basis of post office evidence given during the Horizon scandal. The Government will, in the coming days, consider whether to include the small number of cases that have already been considered by the appeal courts and the convictions upheld. And Lord Arbuthnot, who is an MP at the time of the scandal, says he is delighted with the result. Very pleased indeed. The government has moved very quickly and the drama has had a galvanising effect. I am delighted, both because it means that convictions are going to be overturned, which otherwise uh, simply wouldn't have been, and because it looks as though there's going to be a usefully speeded up uh, way of dealing with uh, compensation, or as we must now call it, redress. Um, so I'm delighted. But Vijay Parekh, one of the victims of the post office scandal, spoke to GB News earlier. He said he wants more to be done. All the people who are involved in this get the same treatment we have had, all this uh, convicted uh, postmasters, and let them feel how we felt. We've done nothing and we've been imprisoned. They have done something, so they need to be imprisoned for the reason what they've done. Well, in other news today, the Defence Secretary says the UK has helped to repel the largest ever attack by Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in the Red Sea. Overnight, HMS Diamond of the Royal Navy, along with the United States, successfully destroyed multiple attack drones. No crew on the warship were injured. They haven't suffered any damage either. Grant Shapps saying the attacks were completely unacceptable and warned there will be consequences. The Yemeni militants have been targeting ships in international waters in support of Hamas in its war with Israel. Now, violence is once again erupting on the streets of Ecuador in Central America with police checkpoints and helicopters patrolling major cities. Ecuador's president, Daniel Noboa, declared a state of emergency yesterday following the prison escape of one of the country's most notorious drug lords. Yesterday, hooded gunmen burst into a live television studio, waving guns and wearing masks. Police confirmed 13 arrests were made. Here at home, the estimated cost of building HS2 between London and, and Birmingham has soared to as much as £66.6 billion. Pounds. The chairman of the project, Sir John Thompson, told MPs the increase is due to original budgets being too low, changes to what he called scope, poor delivery and inflation. In 2013, HS2 was estimated to have a total cost of £37.5 billion for the entire planned network. That included the now scrapped sections from Birmingham to Manchester and Leeds. The world's first ever pothole-preventing robot is set to hit the British roads in Hertfordshire after a successful pilot. The machine, called Arrest Prevent, can identify and classify potholes using AI, artificial intelligence. It can then automatically fill them in uh, to keep out water, which would otherwise seep through the surface, causing more damage. If successful, the machine could save time and money to identify potholes and reduce the disruption they cause to motorists. And a drawing of Queen Victoria is among over 1,700 missing objects from museums in England. The list of misplaced items has been collated by galleries and museums over the last 20 years. The National Portrait Gallery says it has 45 items missing, while the Victoria and Albert Museum say they have more than 180 missing artefacts. And finally, the Princess Royal has been welcomed to Sri Lanka with a traditional dance display. Princess Anne is visiting the South Asian country with her husband to mark 75 years of diplomatic relations. During the three-day visit, the princess is due to meet the country's president and first lady. She'll also undertake engagements and meet local communities as well as faith groups in the capital, Colombo. That's the news on GB News, across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker. This is Britain's News Channel.
Thank you, Polly. Now, we start with the latest dramatic developments in the post office scandal. And that's great news for the hundreds of people who were wrongly convicted. Because Rishi Sunak has confirmed the government will bring in a new law to exonerate the branch managers caught up in the Horizon IT scandal. I'm joined now by our political editor, Christopher Hope. Chris, this time yesterday, you broke the story that Rishi was planning this law to exonerate the postmasters. Today, he did it. Well done. Have you got any lottery numbers? I <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't trust me on lottery numbers. This had a certain inevitability about it, Martin, didn't yeah. it? Because this problem has been going around for years. I've written about it many times in a previous work at The Telegraph I used to work. But I think this, it was this drama um, which put the viewer in the eyes of the sub-postmaster, that you could really understand the gross unfairness of it there and the desperation to find tens of thousands of pounds uh, that wasn't your fault. You were told the computer was right. It's been a wake-up call for the entire political class. This has erupted on the Tory watch, and Mr Sunak, Rishi Sunak is getting ahead of it. There will be a new law in which will exonerate, expunge these convictions. Those numbers again, 980 post, sub-postmasters convicted, uh, 93 of those overturned, one, only one in ten overturned, going far too slowly. An official inquiry, independent, meant to report back in 2022, yeah. it's 2024. I, I think, the, frankly, the politics couldn't wait any longer. They were trying to wait until the end of that inquiry and then, then do something like this. They had to get on with it quickly and done so. There was a risk, of course, because yeah. um, Kevin Hol Hollingrate, the post office minister, has made very clear um, that you might be letting off some sub postmasters who, who did take money, who were guilty, but they feel it's not it's not foolproof, but a proportionate response. Mm. And they'll all sign a document yeah. um, saying that they're claiming that they're, they're, they're innocent, and if that's proven to be untrue, then they will be culpable. The amount of money is, is eye-watering <laughs> at stake here, um, a full pardon, full exoneration, and moving towards financial compensation. Potentially, some numbers saying £600,000 each. It could be that By the much. end of the year. Yeah. Well, now, that be... is an eye-watering sum of money. The big question is, who's going to pay that bill? Well, yes, the taxpayer will pay that bill. We'll come to who might pay that, who else might pay it in a moment. £75,000 announced today on top of the other payments given out. £148 million so far paid out mm. to sub-postmasters. £150 million got on legal fees, yeah. Martin. That's so crazy. the lawyers are benefiting from it, but have benefited so far. It might be that with this, um, this kind of blanket... Um, a nulling of the convictions, the lawyers have less of a role because each one won't, each case won't need more lawyers and it might mean that legal bills come down and more money is available for the victims as postmasters. But who's paying that bill? Well, we are. Mm. Should Fujitsu, of course, the company behind the Horizon scheme, the Horizon computer programme, which went wrong, that is a question which will, will be asked for many days to come. A lot of people are saying that should be the case. So here's a company valued at the thick end of 24 billion quid. Um, it has government contracts to this date over 200 contracts contracts worth approximately £6.7 billion per year. But I guess it's not quite as simple <laughs> as we heard earlier on. It's not quite as simple as just kicking them out, because who could do the job if they weren't still in place? Nevertheless, the government has significant leverage to try and extract the payment from them, because after all, you know, we've seen that they are entirely culpable. Every time that Fujitsu get a contract going forward for a number of years, this will be brought up. Yeah. Why is this happening? It's a re reward for failure mm -hmm. over this contract. I raised this with senior figures in number 10 this week, and they told me for GB News, they said, the problem is we are so reliant on Fujitsu, if we just just remove them, mm. a bit like Huawei, the Chinese telecoms firm from the government infrastructure, from government work, will damage the way we do government work. It will damage other parts of government they can't afford to. But no question, there's a political risk now to this company until they can show that they've dealt with this and seen it properly through. I, I've been wondering what happened here. Why did mm. ministers, officials believe computers against yeah. people, uh, 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 you know, upstanding people in communities? At the time all this happened, um, in the late 20s, 2000s, the government was cutting back the network of post, post offices from 14,000 to 11,500. That was Pat Hewitt. She was mm. the post office minister, the DTI minister. There's lots of battling there with the sub postmasters who didn't want to be shut down against Royal Mail and government. I think at the time, there's lots of anger about and there's tension in the network against the companies, and that may have helped it. But there's no question, there's a wake up call here for officials, civil servants, ministers. Why didn't they believe the people against 
these computers. Is there a case there you make that this was a useful scandal, in a sense? If they wanted to trim back <coughs> the postal service, it was like, well, here comes a scandal, let's, let's utilise that. If that's the case, and we've seen, we spoke to a guest earlier, we'll have a clip of him in a minute, Ian Henderson, who worked for... Um, a company that was brought in to audit and help with the dodgy software with Horizon. When he when he proved that this was the case, they fired him. Yeah, because it was the wrong answer, wasn't it? Because when you bring in consultants, you want to give them the answer you want to have anyway. Any, anyone who runs a company knows that. Uh, I think, yeah, there was there was tension between sub-postmasters, the network, against uh, Post Office Limited Central and then uh, the government about the closure plan. I think that may have meant that people may have thought, well, they're always moaning about something and now it's money going missing. But, of course, this became a huge issue, as we saw in that investigation, and, and it's now come home to roost. We've seen um, Van Ull stripped of a CBE, talk about Ed Davey um, in the firing line as well, his knighthood. Nobody's come out of this <coughs> particularly well or smelling of roses, have they? Um, but credit to Rishi Sunak today, do you think? I mean, he's acted swiftly, considering it's taken many, many years to get to this point, but the end game, the resolution towards justice when it come, it's been pretty swift. Been very swift. I think credit to, to Rishi Sunak. I mean, what else could he have done? Labour, mm. earlier on our new PMQ's live programme, Annalise Dodd said they'll look at the detail of what's been proposed before they can mm. support it, but it's almost as certain they'll support it or the elements of this to make it happen okay. very, very quickly. But Ed Davey, a knighthood, he won't hand it back. He told GB News yesterday he got that when he was over the period he was post office minister questions for him going forward OK well let's have a look at that clip now I spoke about because earlier in the show Chopper I spoke to Ian Henderson he's the co-founder of Second Sight which is the forensic accountants company and they found problems with the post office's Horizon IT system many years before the sub-postmaster's convictions started to be quashed Yeah we were appointed by um, a group of MPs in 2012 to independently investigate concerns about uh, Horizon. Um, and we issued our report, which I think shocked many people, shocked MPs, and led to the formation of a mediation working group because uh, we were dealing with applications from about 140 sub-postmasters who felt that their concerns had not been properly um, or been taken seriously. Uh, and it was that mediation sort of working group that was the first step in g getting some form of redress for individual sub-postmasters. And you came up with the information which the post office didn't like. You raised concerns, they didn't like the sound of those concerns, and they simply terminated your employment. Is that correct? They terminated our, our contracts and they also terminated their support for the mediation sort of working group. Um, so it was, it was a bit of a double whammy, which was unfortunate uh, for, for sub-postmasters and ultimately probably not for, in the best interest of post office either. And this was in 2015. It's now 2023. Yes. Eight our, our, years. Our work starts, it started in 2012. We continued working for post office and, and on behalf of, uh, well, we were appointed by members of parliament. Um, and we worked for about sort of three years. And matters all came to a head in 2015. And by then, we had substantially issued about 140 reports on individual cases affecting sub-postmasters. So 140 clear cases of evidence. Eight years ago, the post office got the information which they'd asked for, they'd paid for, they'd employed you to provide... When you gave it, they didn't like what they heard, and so they got rid of you. This is utterly scandalous. I think that was a view of uh, many MPs and, and certainly many of the participants in, in the mediation working group. I remember talking to Alan Bates at the time, who, who formed the Justice for Sub Postmasters Alliance, and he, re he regarded that the inevitable consequence of the withdrawal of post office from supporting that scheme was he had no option then but to head for, for litigation. And, and he rapidly moved over a period of two or three years towards the, the group litigation order, which was a, a, a civil claim on behalf of, I think it was 555 former sub-postmasters against post office. You know, Chris... When I spoke to Ian Henderson earlier in the show, I couldn't believe what he was saying. Watching it back, I really can't believe what mm. he was saying. He provided the evidence they wanted eight years ago. 
and mm. it simply brushed him to one side. This could have been sorted out so many years ago. Again, it goes back to the point of why do people believe computers over over people? Why do we have a mistrust of what the sub postmaster was saying? The fine upstanding people in their communities, they weren't trusted by the by the kind of the company providing the services, the Horizon, Horizon uh, software, and the post office. It's a complete disgrace. But what? Where does this go? Because okay, today we're seeing we're seeing <coughs> we're seeing an action for for exoneration from Rishi Sunak, talk of compensation, but. Mm. Fujitsu heads yeah. must roll. Well, there's a policing investigation. We have to leave that there, let that take its course. But there's no question, I think, that there's a wake-up call here for any big company providing services to the to, to the government. You, 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 if you've got a problem with your software, make it clear very early on and make, make stop people going to prison for your mistakes. There's a piece in, in your old paper to, today, The Telegraph, saying this post office scandal proves that Britain is ran by cronyism. <laughs> and big money and contracts and it's like money tucked away and little people don't matter and politicians are impotent or don't act until they're forced to. Do you think that will re this just reinforces yeah. <clears throat> that, that feeling of impotence the British public have? And that's why the outpouring of rage over this and anger has been so voluminous. That's right. And you likened it to Brexit, didn't you, on the show mm. yesterday? To mm. The re response has been such... It does feel mm. like this is <clears throat> everyone's got a stake in a local post office. Everyone goes there to buy stamps, mm. send letters, you know, the sub-postmaster. Do you think that person who's been criminalised, many of them um, uh, when they're innocent, is outrageous. I think it does strike at the heart of what our, our fair play and the fact that we seem to have lost, lost sight of what's important in communities and we're taking the word again of faulty um, community systems against those upstanding individuals. It does strike at the heart of everything, I think, about being British and I think finally it's been listened to. MPs have been raising it for years, journalists too. Finally, the officials, the government that runs the show, have got it. I know that you've been banging the drum on this one yeah. alongside yourself there, Chris. So, I, I, this is going to roll and roll and roll. I think every day now, Chris, you know, fresh details, fresh horrors in many senses are just going to keep emerging. Yeah, in many, many ways. It's, it's been, there are often issues in government that are, are bubbling under the rack concrete last September. The government finally got, got across that after 30 years. Here's another case in point. Often I think government is about keeping plates spinning. What's our priorities right now? Well, I think this TV programme last week uh, made this the, the focus of the government's work this week. And we're not really talking about Rwanda just yet, which is no. the immigration plan. We'll have more of that later in the show, though. And anybody out there must agree, you know, we need to give Alan Bates a knighthood. Sir Alan Bates, <coughs> for the work he's done. The CBE's being stripped. Let's talk, talk of knighthoods being stripped. That fella surely is the very best of British. On the same topic, the first Prime Minister's questions of the year took place this lunchtime. In fact, I was there. And Lee Anderson had the first question of the year. And as you'd expect, he made sure that the session started with a bang by asking asking about Sir Ed Davey. This is the same Liberal Democrat leader who in the past has called for the resignation of over 30 prominent people in this country who have made mistakes in their job. So does the Prime Minister agree with me that the leader of the Lib Dem should take his own advice and start by clearing his desk, clear his diary and clear off? There you go, he started the new year with a bang, a battle subtle as a house brick to the head. But nevertheless, entertaining and indeed, you know, where is Ed Davey? Will he have those questions to answer? And this is a topic that's really, really motivated you today because lots of you have been getting in touch with your thoughts on this big story. Judy says this, I'm getting very cross with this government. How can they make up a law just like this in days? However, they can't pass one on other just as important issues. This proves it can be done if they want to. Well, Judy, I will counter with that with saying, well, well fair play to them. It's taken years and years to get to this point, but when they've had to act quickly, they have. If only, but I agree, they do things like this on other matters. For example, as Chobba just said, Rwanda. John says this. I have two points. All the convictions were based on false evidence, so should be quashed. If there were guilty people involved, then they should be retired with proper evidence. Many of the postmasters paid money they didn't owe to try and avoid prosecution. How much was this and who will pay this back? It was, in effect, stolen by the post office. John, that is an excellent point. A superb point. They were paying money to make this go away. They were taking legal raps. They were being convicted to make it go away, to avoid jail. They were doing plea bargains, which they were not guilty of, coughing up money they didn't owe, just to try and make this all go away. And that's one of the terrible things about this injustice. Ordinary, hard-working pillars of the community made to feel like they were the bad guy when they were not. 
We'll have lots more on this massive story at five o'clock. And there's plenty of coverage on our website, gbnews.com. And you've helped to make it the fastest growing national news website in the country. So thank you very much. Now, the controversial Rwanda bill is back in the Commons next Tuesday. Is the right wing of the Tory party going to scupper Rishi Sunak's hopes of making it law? And what about the other side? I think they will too. I'm Martin Dorbley on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Wake up to the headlines with headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Kers, on this Saturday night showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday night showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's 4.26. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Later this hour, we'll cross the Farnborough after the Home Office backed down over its controversial plan to house 300 asylum seekers in luxury flats. And the locals were not happy. We'll speak to one shortly. 
Now, Rishi Sunak is braced for a Commons showdown once again over his Rwanda plan after being warned by Tory MPs that the proposal will not work unless it is significantly beefed up. A large number of right-wing Conservatives are backing amendments to the bill aimed at effectively ignoring international law. And Robert Jenrick, who quit as Immigration Minister, if you recall, over the bill, has warned that the plan, quote, simply doesn't work in its current form. Well, to discuss this further, I'm now joined by immigration lawyer Harjap Sin Bangal. Welcome to the show. It's always a pleasure. Are we there? Hello, good afternoon. And a happy new year. I think it's the first time we've spoken this year. Happy. Here we go again. It's Groundhog Day. Once again, the Tory left say the plan is too strong. The Tory right say it's too weak. Um, are you expecting any beefed up um, legislation, particularly removing uh, the UK's um, adherence to ECHR law, which is what the Tory rights want. They want to block the ECHR from grounding flights, block illegal immigrants from lodging individual claims, stop ECHR um, blocking deportations. They're kind of turning their guns on the ECHR. Are you expecting any of that legislation to have any chance of getting through? I don't think so. I mean, um, the number of rebels is not enough unless Labour vote with them. So if mm. Labour don't vote with them, mm. then it won't be enough to bring the changes about. And also Rishi Sunak is very carefully poised because he's got to look at the fact that Rwanda have indicated, look, that if this is going to break any international laws, then we're not going to cooperate. And remember, we've already paid Rwanda and it's a non-refundable amount. So there's it's already 300 million. So I think that the rebels... As much as the noise that they're creating, I don't think that they really have as much um, sort of chance on this. And they're probably there will be some talks. They might have one or two sort of concessions by Rishi Sunak, but um, he sort of carefully poised us to not um, let the whole deal get out of hand because this is one of his flagship sort of promises. And Harjap, um, I don't need any excuse to bring up Brexit, but it does feel like Brexit again. It feels like the two, the two sides of the Tory party arguing about something which neither side thinks is sufficiently strong enough or lame enough, however you want to look at it, and never the twain shall meet. And yet, of course, this still has to pass through the Lords. And when we had Kate Hoey on the show last year, she, she called it the House of Remainers, and she should know she's one of them. And therein lies the rub. If they try and beef it up, it'll get voted down anyway, won't it? Well, it can be sent back, but ultimately it can be pushed through. But I think what they've got to take into consideration is what the UK Supreme Court said, and that, you know, as long as we can satisfy that or the government can satisfy that, they'll get this bill through. But this is not a good look for the party in an election year, which should be um, united. And it's already suffering in the polls. And once again, it's showing the public, is this a party fit to govern? I mean, you've got, they can't even agree with each other on simple bits. It's not just one bit. It's not just a Rwanda scheme. It's also other policies. They cannot seem to unite on this. It's a party divided. And I think the public is seeing that and it's saying, well, hold on. This is a party that does not back its leader. This is a party that cannot agree. Um, it's had multiple leaders in the past few years. We've had multiple home secretaries. In fact, the fact is we've had more home secretaries go to Rwanda than actually asylum seekers. Are they fit to govern? And I think that will tell at the polls, this is definitely not a good look for the Conservative Party. They really need to sort this out in an election year. And that's why Rishi Sunak's going to take as long as he can and leave it to as late as he can to actually get the election. Yeah, do you know what? I think you're absolutely right. I think with this and the improving economy, they will try and go as long term as they can. Immigration lawyer Hojap Singh Bangal, thank you for joining us on the show. It's always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and five o'clock as the Bank of England governor is grilled by the Treasury Committee. Could interest rates finally start to come down? Well, here's hoping. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. The headlines this hour. The post office workers caught up in the Horizon IT scandal will have their convictions overturned by signing to their innocence on a single document. Postal Services Minister Kevin Hollenrake says new emergency legislation to exonerate the workers may take some weeks but insists it is a priority for the government. 
There'll also be an upfront payment of £75,000 for each victim to compensate them for being pilloried, jailed or bankrupted as a result of flawed computer software which wrongly indicated they'd been stealing post office money. Vijay Parekh was a victim of the scandal. He says those responsible must be held accountable. All the people who are involved in this get the same treatment we have had, all the uh, convicted uh, postmasters, and let them feel how we felt. We've done nothing and we've been in prison. They have done something, so they need to be in prison for the reason what they've done. In other news today, the Defence Secretary says the UK has helped to fight off the largest ever attack by Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in international shipping lanes. The Royal Navy's HMS Diamond, supported by the United States military, successfully destroyed multiple drone attacks swarming over container shipping in the Red Sea. Grant Shapps says the attacks were completely unacceptable and warned there would be further consequences. Yemeni militants have been targeting commercial shipping in support of Hamas and its war with Israel. There's still uncertainty and violence on the streets of Ecuador in Central America today. Police checkpoints are in place and helicopters are patrolling major cities after a sudden grapple for power between state and drugs cartels. The president, Daniel Nemur, declared a state of emergency following the prison escape of one of the country's most notorious drugs lords. And last night, gunmen took control of a live TV studio, taking hostages and making threats. The military were deployed to the streets to take back control and police rounded up and arrested suspects. The estimated cost of building HS2 between London and Birmingham has soared to as much as £66.6 .6 billion. The chairman of the project, Sir John Thompson, told MPs the increase was due to original budgets being too low, changes to scope, poor delivery and inflation. In 2013, HS2 was estimated to cost £37.5 billion for the entire planned network that included the now scrapped sections from Birmingham to Manchester and Leeds. Those are the headlines. More on all those stories by heading to our website, gbnews.com. Thank you, Polly. Now, the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey says he hopes that the recent fall in the cost of mortgages would continue, and don't we all? Bailey appeared before the Treasury Committee today and facing questions about interest rates ahead of the bank's decision on the 1st of February. Well, joining me now is Liam Halligan, GB News' business and economics editor with On The Money. Liam, Andrew Bailey, um, in, in a, a rare positive mood. Good to be with you, Martin. Um, so, yeah, the Governor of the Bank of England appeared before the Treasury Select Committee, cross-party group of MPs. He was a bit poker-faced, though, as you'd expect from a Governor of the yeah. Bank of England. But, you know, let's be completely clear. I'm getting stopped on the street all the time these days by people asking me, Liam, where's interest rates going to go? I've got a mortgage. My kid's got a mortgage. Should they stick? Should they twist? Should they fix? Should they go for a variable rate? What is going to happen with interest mm -hmm. rates? Let's have a look at Bank of England interest rates now in this graphic. We can see here that back in 2017, interest rates were ultra low. Uh, they went up to about 1%. They then went to just a quarter of 1% during lockdown. And since then, we've had those 14 successive rate rises all the way to where we are now at 5.25%. But look, the vast majority of people, certainly in financial markets, think that the next move in interest rates will be down because inflation's coming down. The question is when. Mm. Now, the Bank of England is insisting it's not going to lower interest rates for a long time, certainly not before the summer, probably in the autumn. I'm not buying that whatsoever. I think the Bank of England will, raise, will lower interest rates in the spring. That's because the Federal Reserve in the US mm. will probably lower interest rates in the spring. And it's not just me that thinks that. It's also the mortgage companies. Yes. That's why the mortgage companies now are offering rates that are below the Bank of England base rate because it thinks over a five-year period, for as long as you fix, they're offering like about 4%. The average interest rate during that period will be below 4% because it will come down heavily from five and a quarter now. 
Uh, Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey, he told MPs, uh, just let me just flesh out that quote that you gave, mm. obviously we have a, had a big change in market interest mm. rates, the mortgage rates that are offered, uh, the rates that the markets charge governments to borrow at. Obviously we've had a big change in market interest rates, says Andrew Bailey, in the last few months, and so the cost of mortgages is now coming down. He said he wants to see that c continue. He thinks that... that he wants the, the reduction in mortgage costs to carry on. And so say all of us, because a lot of households now, they've been hammered yeah. because they've come off low fixed rate mortgages. They've had to remortgage at much, much higher interest rates. Perhaps there will soon be some relief in sight. And Liam, I know you've been saying for a long, long time that the, the, the high interest rates is just making people sit on their hands. People are being hammered at both ends on their mortgages, on the, any loans they have, businesses too, of course, at those base rates. And so they're nervous, they're flighty about spending money, investing, even the supermarket. So unlocking the economy, you've, you've maintained for many, many months, interest rates being cut, that's the way out of the gloom. I think it is the way out of the gloom as long as you don't provoke inflation. Mm. And it does look as if inflationary pressures are receding. Prices are still going up, but lower inflation means that they're going up at a lower rate. You've got some people saying that inflation will hit its 2% target sometime over the spring and summer. And I'm increasingly coming to that view as well. Inflation could probably overshoot going below 2%, mm. particularly because... Those 14 interest rate rises we've had, Martin, mm. they take a long time to have an impact. A lot of that monetary tightening is still in the tank. That's why I think it's absolutely absurd that three members of the nine economists on the Monetary Policy Committee, just before Christmas, they were still voting to raise interest rates. It's crazy. I mean, I don't know if these people understand the most basic aspects mm. of economics. Mm. And I say that with some <laughs> regret. Look, I do think interest rates are going to come down soon. That is my base case. But there is a kind of blot on the landscape, if you liked. And again, you and me have talked about it, and I maintain it. Yep. I'm talking about geopolitical whiz-bangs. No, it's the Red Sea. If we get big conflict in the Middle East, mm. if we get big escalation in Russia, Ukraine, these are energy centres. This will really roil financial markets. Energy prices could shoot up again. Inflation could shoot up again. And then when it comes to interest rates, all bets are off. But my base case is that rates are coming down, relief in the pipeline for households with variable rate mortgages. And the relief in the pipeline, Liam, politically, uh, we talked earlier about Rwanda, um, the longer the election is, is called, more chance of flights taken off, the, long, the later the election, more chance of these green shoots coming through and maybe convincing voters the Tories know what they're doing with the economy. Well, again, I've been writing in my Telegraph column for at least three months that the Tories would play the long game yeah. when it comes to the election because they want the benefits of these lower interest rates, better consumer confidence. We are starting to see signs of that now amidst mm. the gloom to try and impact and to try and generate even the most feeble of feel-good factors <laughs> yeah. by the time of the summer and the autumn. They won't want to wait too far beyond September, October. Mm. No one wants an election in the run-up to Christmas, certainly not an election in early 2025, and Sunak is, has actually all but ruled that out. Mm. So I'm thinking increasingly it's going to be a September or an October election, one side or the other, of the Conservative Party conference this autumn, if indeed there is a Conservative Party conference. They may yet end up cancelling it. You heard it here first. Well, there's, there's another big line there, Liam. Always on the money. Liam Halligan, superb stuff, as ever. Great to have you in the studio. Thanks for joining us. Now, moving on, many local residents in Farnborough are relieved after plans to house asylum seekers in luxury flats have been halted. More on that after this. I've got a superb interview with a local. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. 
Well, I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Welcome back. It's 4.44. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, let's get more on a story that's on this show that's been following closely over the last few days, and it's a victory for residents in Farnborough who were fighting plans to house almost 350 asylum seekers in luxury apartments in the town. And the new block of over 100 flats were available for rent at £1,400 per month before it was suddenly taken over by the Home Office. But after an outcry from many locals, the plan has allegedly been paused with immediate effect. And I'm joined now by local resident Gemma Lyons. Gemma, welcome to the show. It's fantastic to have you on GB News. So, Gemma, I wanted to get a local's perspective on this because we, we hear about the sensation, we hear about the headlines. You live very locally. You're a mum. Um, what is it about this development that concerns you, Gemma? Uh, I think, I mean, there's a lot of concerns and there's a lot of worries. Um, I think any group, 300, 350 people strong, um, sort of dumped in one place um, from any war-torn country where all they've experienced is violence, um, is, is going to be a worry. Um, we don't know who these people are. We don't know what trauma they've got from what they've seen. We don't know if they are, you know, here for to it to sort of embrace our culture. Um, and from what I've seen, living in temporary accommodation myself, I have to say I was really, really quite taken back by actually how many of them were just middle-aged men 
um, probably about four or five of them in individual single rooms. Um, so I struggle to believe that when they're saying actually these um, refugees are the majority are women and family, I'm not sure how how much I believe that. Um, I actually attended Farnborough Tech College, um, I still do, which is directly opposite. And um, last year, I my course was in the evening. Now, as a woman, as a young woman, um, walking past a group of men, um, knowing that they respect and value the same, um, the same va um, values and respect women the way we do, is is that's intimidating it's set in itself so to walk past a group of people at that time of evening personally i i wouldn't feel safe um and it's a difficult one isn't it because i think we we all understand that um these people you know women and children they do need somewhere to go but i i don't think that the strategies have been put in place um it's been addressed to the community by the council in a way that it, I, I see it sort of, you know, them being able to integrate well into our community. I think it's a case of um, we've got to be seen to be doing something. Let's plonk them there and forget about it. 300 people in a place where, I'm sorry, not many of us are welcoming them. It's already going to cause a lot of friction. And I worry that it's going to be a case of us and them. Um, you know, they're not... It, it's. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I know what I mean. So, so Gemma, um, of course, it's important not to be too jubilant, of course, about um, this plan not going ahead. It only has been temporarily paused, of course, and that could mean it could still go ahead. So it's important to keep shining a light on it. But the local MP, uh, Mr Doherty, um, claimed it's the wrong place altogether. But people in response have been saying, well, that's nimbyism. And you've already said that these people need to live somewhere. Do you think the people saying that you're just a NIMBY, do they have a point or they don't understand your locality? I mean, yeah, I mean, my, my family, um, five generations of my family have lived and worked and put money into the economy um, surrounding this area. You're talking, this, this place is located in the middle of a fully functioning community. You've got an all-girls school up the road. You've got an all-boys school down the road, privately funded. You've got the college across the road. You know, not, not do I think it's just unfair on us. Um, but actually on them as well. Why would you, why would, I, I mean, they're, they're being set up probably not in the best way for them to settle and um, do do what they've got to do. I don't really understand, you know, another what, what they'll be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we know, I know from friends and family that a universal credit pay, pay packet, um, people are struggling to, um, for them to see, it's going from month to month with that. I mean, so these people, no doubt, will probably be running out of money. They'll be bored uh, in the middle of a, you know, fully functioning community. So I just think it, it was it was quite shocking at how quickly the council made such a rash decision without informing or um, consulting anyone in the community. And for that reason alone, I find it worrying because there has to be a strategy, there has to be a plan. You know, the people, there's a lot of people who I know, you know, are welcoming of them. Well, these are the people that need to sort of get behind them and come, you know, are, are we going to are we gonna have some sort of course to integrate them into our community, to teach them the English way? Or is it going to be a case of us having to conform to their ways and, you know, when their children go to school? our schools and it, 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 it can't just be done overnight you know I, that, that's yeah. my worry and it's made me lose a lot of trust in the local council um and you know it's, it's it's worrying really worrying that they can make such a big decision for somewhere that they've probably not grown up in um which can really f affect the dynamic of our community 
Okay, um, th thank you very much for speaking to us on GB News today. Um, Gemma Lyons, a local mum who lives a stone's throw from that block of luxury flats in Farnborough, um, which has been temporarily paused, apparently, but it's one we will certainly be keeping an eye on on GB News. Now, we have a Home Office spokesperson response, and they said this. We have always been upfront about the unprecedented pressure being put on our asylum system, brought about by a significant increase in dangerous and illegal journeys journeys into the country over recent years. The Home Office has a duty to provide safe and secure housing for asylum seekers. The site in Farnborough will house otherwise destitute families and single adult females while they await their final asylum decisions. We are continuing to work closely with Rushmore Council as well as the local NHS and police services to manage any impact in the area and address the local community's concerns. OK, moving on. A whopping 8.5 million Brits have pledged to go sober for dry January. Well, Tim Martin, of course, the founder of the pub chain Weatherspoons, has called dry January a cult. And with recent studies showing supermarkets have increased the price of low and non-alcoholic booze by 22% since last month, what impact is this all having on our hospitality industry? Well, joining me now is Michael Kill, CEO of the Nighttime Industries. And welcome to the show, Michael. I know you've been campaigning on these issues for many, many years and including fighting very, very hard for the Nighttime Industries during lockdowns and COVID. You're an absolute pioneer during that. And here we are again, dry January. Tim Martin is calling it a cult. What does it do to the Nighttime Industries, Michael? Well, it's another year and another challenge, as you can appreciate. I mean, we've had four years of a very, very tough trading period. Uh, this, again, is a huge challenge. We're not only contending with the cost of uh, operating crisis, um, but we're also contending with the customer behaviour changes. And, you know, this uh, uh, sober month or sobriety month is is a challenge. But let's be honest about it. There, There is this movement towards uh, no and low alcohol products. Uh, people are still coming out because those social environments and those experiences, particularly cultural experiences, are really important. But, you know, the one message that I would push alongside my colleagues is to go out and support hospitality and uh, clubs and venues and, and all of these amazing sort of hospitality and cultural spaces that are really the backbone of many of the communities around the country. So for me, it's just continue to support whether you come out and you, you drink no and low, which is in some respects, something that's been taken up uh, and changed alongside things like premiumization. And so it's just important to support, which is the important bit. But uh, yes, it does present some challenges. And that's maybe some good news for you quickly, because they're looking at a 23 percent price, price hike, beg your pardon, of brands, including Zero Guinness. Um, so maybe they will start coming out to your places more often, Michael, very quickly, if we could. Well, as you can appreciate, I mean, it's always been a challenge between supermarkets and home drinking and coming out to the, the pubs and bars uh, within the high street and, and your, your local. So for us, it's, you know, it's really important that we support those those local businesses, something that uh, it's been a challenge for, for many years now. But uh, yes, as, as you know, we're trying to contend with the pricing uh, challenges, the okay. costs that we're trying to weather. Um, Okay, okay, Michael Kill, we have to leave it there and best of luck in the new year. Rishi Sunak has confirmed the government will bring in a plan to exonerate post office scandal victims. We'll have more on that after this. I'm Martin Dorby on GB News. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again, it's Aidan McKibben here from the Met Office with the GB News forecast. It's feeling cold out there today. There are some sunny skies around, but otherwise a lot of cloud is covering the country, especially across northeastern parts. High pressure currently driving east to northeasterly winds in across the UK. Feeling cold in that wind despite the sunshine in the south and a lot of cloud elsewhere will bring some spots of rain and drizzle to Wales, northern and eastern England, southern Scotland. That will tend to fade through the night. Clear skies in the south will lead to a frost in many places, although there will be some patchy cloud cover developing. Minus one to minus two Celsius in the south, a frost also likely for western Scotland under clear spells. But elsewhere where we've got the cloud, it's going to be a frost-free start to Thursday. Temperatures of 4 to 6 Celsius across East Wales into the Midlands, eastern England, southern and eastern Scotland. 
We've got less of a wind on Thursday, so perhaps not feeling quite as cold in the south. We've got a sunny start in the south, but increasingly the cloud builds from the northeast, keeping the sunshine towards the far southwest, increasing sunshine across central and western Scotland. Otherwise, a lot of cloud, but fewer showers around compared with today. Into Friday, a frosty start for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Clear skies here, generally cloudy elsewhere. And into the weekend, a big change in the weather comes along as Arctic winds arrive with snow showers for Scotland. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Wake up to the headlines with headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, oh. Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, it's 5pm. Welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster and all across the UK. Now, there's some great news today for hundreds of post office branch managers wrongly convicted. The Prime Minister's promised to bring in a new law to exonerate them. Rishi Sunak is getting ready for a battle with Tory MPs over the Rwanda bill, with one influential former minister saying the plan, quote, simply doesn't work. And congratulations to Sadiq Khan. He's turned London into the slowest city in the world. 
That's all coming in your next hour. And as usual, I'd like to hear from you. Email me, please, gbviews at gbnews.com. What next for the post office scandal? Is it time for Fujitsu to get their big wallets out? 27 billion quid the company's worth. They've got deep pockets. Is it time for them to get some compensation moving for the postmasters? What about Sadiq Khan, um, your favourite mayor? The world's slowest city and other bad news all coming up. Of course, that's after your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you. Well, the top stories this hour. Post office workers caught up in the Horizon IT scandal could have their names cleared by the end of this year. Postal Services Minister Kevin Hollenrake says new legislation to exonerate sub-postmasters and mistresses in England and Wales will be introduced within weeks. There'll also be an upfront payment of £75,000 to compensate those who were jailed or bankrupted as a result of flawed computer software, which wrongly showed money was missing. Mr Hollenrake says victims will get the justice they deserve. We intend to bring forward legislation as soon as we can to overturn the convictions of all those convicted in England or Wales on the basis of post office evidence given during the Horizon scandal. The Government will, in the coming days, consider whether to include the small number of cases that have already been considered by the appeal courts and the convictions upheld. Well, Lord Arbuthnot, who is an MP at the time of the scandal, is pleased with the result. Very pleased indeed. The Government has moved very quickly and the drama has had a galvanising effect. I am delighted, both because it means that convictions are going to be overturned, which otherwise uh, simply wouldn't have been, and because it looks as though there's going to be a usefully speeded up uh, way of dealing with uh, compensation, or as we must now call it, redress. Um, so but one of the victims of the post office scandal, Vijay Parekh, spoke to GB News earlier. He said more should be done. All the people who are involved in this get the same treatment we have had, all the uh, convicted uh, postmasters, and let them feel how we felt. We've done nothing and we've been in prison. They have done something, so they need to be in prison for the reason what they've done. In other news today, the UK has helped fight off the largest ever attack by Houthi rebels of international shipping in the Red Sea. The Defence Secretary says the Royal Navy's destroyer, HMS Diamond, along with US military support, successfully destroyed multiple attack drones. Grant Schaaf described the attacks as completely unacceptable and warned there would be further consequences. HMS Diamond, amongst uh, a number of other US ships, were involved in shooting down a whole barrage of missiles and drones. HMS, HMS Diamond herself shot down seven drones. Uh, remember, this is not usual. It was over three decades until a couple of weeks ago uh, that the Royal Navy had not fired anything down in anger. Um, and we cannot have a situation where a major sea route, a major ability to move goods around the world is being cut off by terrorists and thugs, and we therefore must act. Police say half of all child sexual abuse cases reported to police in 2022 were crimes committed by minors. That's according to data gathered by police in England and Wales. Half of the offences involved a child aged 10 to 17 as a suspect or perpetrator in what the force called a growing and concerning trend. The figures are up from a third in 2013. A Nottinghamshire police constable is under investigation for possible driving offences following the death of an eight-year-old. A retired photographer, Trevor Bartlett, was hit by a police van on a pedestrian crossing in Nottingham in December. The constable who was driving the van has been accused of causing death by dangerous and careless, inconsiderate driving. The officer has also been served with a gross misconduct notice for potential breaches of police standards for professional behaviour. 
In Central America, violence erupted on the streets of Ecuador yesterday with police checkpoints and helicopters patrolling major cities after drug cartels took on the state. Ecuador's president, Daniel Noboa, declared a state of emergency following the prison escape of one of the country's most notorious drug lords. And yesterday, gunmen burst into a live TV studio waving guns and wearing masks while holding the crew hostage. The military were deployed onto the streets and police confirmed suspects had been detained and arrests made. Here, the estimated cost of building the HS2 rail link between London and Birmingham has soared to £66.6 billion. The chairman of the project, Sir John Thompson, told MPs the increase was due to the original budget estimates being too low, poor standards of delivery and inflation. In 2013, HS2 was estimated to cost £37.5 billion. That's for the entire planned network that included the now scrapped sections from Birmingham to Manchester and Leeds. And the Princess Royal has been welcomed to Sri Lanka with a traditional dance display. Princess Anne is visiting the South Asian country with her husband to mark 75 years of diplomatic relations. During the three-day visit, the Princess will meet the country's President and First Lady. She'll also meet local community leaders and faith groups in the capital, Colombo. That's the news on GB News, across the UK on TV, in your car on digital radio and on your smart speaker. This is Britain's News Channel. Thank you, Polly. Now we start with the latest dramatic developments in the post office scandal. And there's great news for the hundreds of people who were wrongly convicted. Rishi Sunak has confirmed the government will bring in a new law to exonerate the branch managers caught up in the Horizon IT scandal. I'm joined by our political editor, Christopher Hope. Chris, you called this yesterday. You broke the news. Rishi was going to pass this new law, this new bill, to exonerate those hundreds of postmasters and postmistresses. That's indeed happened today at Prime Minister's Question Time. Yeah, kind of no surprise, but to say yeah, it's quite a dramatic moment. It's almost historic mm. to have Parliament to publish a bill, uh, some legislation to overrule what's happening in the courts, because technically Parliament is a court and courts don't like to clash with other courts, if you see what I mean. So it's dramatic, but it needs to happen because mm. the inquiry into this miscarriage of justice was meant to finish in 2022. That hasn't, hasn't happened. No sign of it ending any time soon. I think the politics simply bubbled up below the inquiry and has gone straight through the back door and out the mm -hmm. front door to deal with this problem straight away. 980 sub-postmasters are convicted, just 93 mm. overturned, one in ten. That is going far too slow. Some have died, of course, as we know, don't we? The announcement today from the Prime Minister, £75,000 up front, um, many more thousands of pounds to come for these people, these poor people affected by this. He called it one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in our nation's history. Um, he said it's very clear that uh, the, 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 this needs to get on with it and, and get on fast. Now, what will happen going forward is this bill will be published in a few weeks' time. Should get Labour support, but uh, Labour's chairman Annalise Dodds told us on our, our show today, PMQ's Live, that they'll wait and see the detail of what's in there. But the, the, the idea behind it is supported by the leaders of all the main parties. Those who, who, uh, who ever were convicted will be asked to sign a piece of paper to say, I never mm. took any money legally from the post office. That will mean all of the convictions are expunged. But if they're found late after the event, two have taken money by the police or whoever, they can be prosecuted for fraud. So this is why they think it ties it with a nice bow to deal with the problem. This is the beginning of a long scandal. We haven't yet seen what happened with Fujitsu, the company behind mm. it, uh, the Horizon software that went so wrong for these people, the cost of the payments to the, um, the, the sub-postmasters, who pays that? Is that Fujitsu or not, or the taxpayer, as currently seen? And, of course, there's a political fallout because mm. there might well be some emails, some some uh, notes from ministers at the time who, over, who didn't want to meet Alan Bates, who didn't want to see him or, or raise the concerns, but were too credulous in believing what the post office was yeah. saying. We'll see that played out.
Let's talk first about the financial sums involved. Could be eye-watering, astonishing amounts of money. Um, it's said in some of the literature today, could be as much as potentially £600,000 yep. each for some of the postmasters. It might depend on the age of the sub-postmaster. Often these um, payments are, are settled on what that person would have earned. Yes. If they hadn't received um, a conviction, they weren't meant to get. So a very young sub postmaster might say, "Well, my entire life has been ruined. My life of earnings, mm. and the money will replace those earnings." Older sub postmasters might get less, but six hundred thousand pounds sounds like an average. So mm. some figures will be a lot more than that, and some a lot less than that. And some, of course, sadly died and took their lives. I wonder if they will get conversation well, all their relatives I mean, they if there are any justice again, they should that will be tied to caring costs so if that person was a carer and wasn't around to care for somebody else the cost of providing that care will be paid for by the state so that's where that comes comes from eye watering numbers but then again jujitsu fujitsu big important have very deep pockets 24 billion they're valued at and indeed they still benefit from very handsome government yeah. contracts 200 public contracts indeed worth the thick end of seven billion quid they're not short of a bob or two why should the taxpayer pick up this bill well that will come out from the inquiry now if the inquiry finds that, that the fujitsu were on the hook for this and and should pay out then that'll be very hard for them to resist that now of course fujitsu are heavily involved in all sorts of government contracts and we've been pressing number 10 to say why not put a stay on all new contracts yeah. given to Fujitsu maybe even strip them out of the government infrastructure that's very hard they say because in fact it would mean that some government services would be badly affected so they are stuck with this supplier but going forward any new contracts let to Fujitsu, let to Fujitsu could look like a reward for failure because of their behavior over the post office uh, scandal. OK, now, earlier on, Chris, I spoke to Ian Henderson. He's the co-founder of Second Sight, which is a forensic accountants company. They found problems with the post office's Horizon IT system many years before the sub-postmaster's convictions even started to be quashed. Yeah, we were appointed by um, a group of MPs in 2012 to independently investigate concerns about uh, Horizon. Um, and we issued our report, which I think shocked many people, shocked MPs, and led to the formation of a mediation working group because uh, we were dealing with applications from about 140 sub-postmasters who felt that their concerns had not been properly um, or been taken seriously. Uh, and it was that mediation sort of working group that was the first step in g getting some form of redress for individual sub-postmasters. And you came up with the information which the post office didn't like. You raised concerns, they didn't like the sound of those concerns, and they simply terminated your employment. Is that correct? They terminated our, our contracts and they also terminated their support for the mediation sort of working group. Um, so it was, it was a bit of a double whammy, which was unfortunate uh, for, for sub postmasters and ultimately probably not for the, in the best interests of post office either. And this was in 2015. It's now 2023. Yes. Eight our, our, years. Our work starts, it started in 2012. We continued working for post office and, and on behalf of, uh, well, we were appointed by members of parliament. Um, uh, and we worked for about sort of three years. And matters all came to a head in 2015. And by then, we had substantially issued about 140 reports on individual cases affecting sub-postmasters. So 140 clear cases of evidence. Eight years ago, the post office got the information which they'd asked for, they'd paid for, they'd employed you to provide, when you gave it, they didn't like what they heard, and so they got rid of you. This is utterly scandalous. I think that was the view of uh, many MPs and, and certainly many of the participants in, in the mediation working group. I remember talking to Alan Bates at the time, who, who formed the Justice for Sub Postmasters Alliance, and he, re he regarded that the inevitable consequence of the withdrawal of post office from supporting that scheme was he had no option then but to head for, for litigation. And, and he rapidly moved over a period of two or three years towards the, the group litigation order, which was a, a, a civil claim on behalf of, I think it was 555 former sub-postmasters against post office. Chris, you know, at the time I did that interview with Ian Henderson, I couldn't believe what he was saying. Watching it back, I just find it just astonishing. 
that here's a company that was brought in to paid mm. and asked yeah. Um, yeah. to perform a full audit on Horizon within the post office. They yeah. did that over three years. They presented the evidence eight years ago in 2015, and when the post office saw the evidence, they fired them because they because didn't get the answers they wanted. didn't want to listen to what was happening. Mm. It goes back to the heart of the story and why it's so damaging politically, I think, because it had officials, ministers, Sir Ed Davey will come to him shortly, mm. Post Office Minister 2010, 2012. They preferred to believe computers against people. Now, that is a politically yeah. a disaster. The idea that a computer can't, can't mislead. And, in fact, Paula Venels, um, mm. the CBE, to be removed by the King shortly, was given that honour by the Tory government in 2019 after... Dozens of these convictions were qu quashed. Even when the evidence was there, they were being quashed. She still got her honour. And do you think, Chris, that the, the public outrage over this case is a rage not just against the injustice that the individual suffered, but a rage, a feeling of, of impotence? Yeah. The public don't count. You know, pillars of the community, post office masters and, and mistresses, you know, stand up yeah. public servants, the, the first interface of officialdom for, for, yeah. for, for millions and millions, particularly of pensioners, people they respect, been trampled on, and yet years and years, successive governments, every political party, none of yeah. them have come out this uh, smelling of roses. Well, I was one of the journalists who broke the MP expenses scandal back in mm. 2009, and this is, this is a bit like that. Yeah. Not on the same scale, but there's a sense that the whole country is united behind this injustice. Mm. And there's a sense, back in the MP expense scandal, there's a feeling that they're all lining their pockets at our expense. Yeah. And that, of course, was dealing with a whole political class and led to a clear out of Parliament, the resignation of the Speaker of the House of Commons at the time. But that kind of anger, not as extreme, but that kind of anger is what I'm seeing in our emails here at GB News mm. and from viewers and listeners, and just a reaction to this. And this is why I think it's the beginning of a wake-up call for the establishment to listen to people, don't trust machines, listen to... And these aren't people, these are, these are pillars of the community, these mm. sub-postmasters. They deserve the respect, they got none of it, and now there's a reckoning for our political class. Rishi Sunak tried to make that good today and went a great deal towards doing that by introducing this new bill. But, of course, as I said, you know, political parties of all stripes haven't done <coughs> well out of this. You talked about Ed Davey, and let's look at that now, because the first Prime Minister's questions of the year took place this lunchtime. In fact, I was there, and Lee Anderson had the first question. And as you'd expect, he made sure the session started with a bang by asking about Sir Ed Davey. This is the same Liberal Democrat leader who in the past has called for the resignation of over 30 prominent people in this country who have made mistakes in their jobs. So does the Prime Minister agree with me that the leader of the Lib Dems should take his own advice and start by clearing his desk, clear his diary and clear off? As usual, Chris, um, Lee Anderson, about <laughs> as subtle as a house brick to the head. But does he have a point? Ed Davey was the post minister at the time, or were they just trying to deflect from their own incompetence? I think he has got a point. There is anger about uh, Sir Ed Davey. Sir Ed Davey got his knighthood for political and public service in 2015. Mm. He was post office minister from 2010 to 2012. Lee Anderson, not for the first time, has got his finger on the pulse of public opinion, I would argue. There is an, a uh, petition put down today at change.org. Set over 7,200 signatures, 5,667 signed today, demanding that he return his knighthood mm. over the post office scandal. Now, we revealed yesterday how Sir Davey is saying he won't hand back his knighthood. He blames being misled by the post office at the time. Yes. He believed them and, and the rest of it. But I think there was a political reckoning, I think. But yes, for Sir Ed Davey, he was, that was back in 2010, 2012. For this Tory government, they've been in power for 14 years. Mm. They've allowed that no one to get uh, punished or dealt with. The inquiry was late to be set up. There are questions for this government. And also, don't forget, the Labour government that brought in the Horizons um, programme in the first place. It's across all of these people. Like the rack concrete with, mm. with schools when the roofs are caving yes. in. It's a plague on all their houses, Martin. Yeah, a lot of them could have done something about it. And indeed, Keir Starmer was being asked questions yesterday. He was in charge of the Director of Public Prosecutions at the time. Why didn't he get involved? And indeed, the, yep. the, they, they actually went after about a dozen postmasters themselves, the DPP. Yeah, we think, yeah, uh, low dozens, maybe 12 or more, a few more than that. Mm. Now, uh, mostly these are private prosecutions by the post office. They may lose their right 
like to prosecute in future. But a, a, a small number were done by the Crown Prosecution Service. What does Sir Keir Starmer know? Nigel Farage has been talking about that, of course, on his programme. Tory MPs again today raising that in House of Commons. And yesterday, it's been made clear by the government the CPS could have stepped in and stopped these inquiries if they felt they had evidence to. They didn't. Why didn't they? Sir Keir Starmer we would have been aware of the coverage in newspapers and elsewhere. Why didn't he step in? There are questions for all politicians. Sir Keir Starmer is no exception. Yeah, and um, Lee Anderson's comments have provoked a reaction from Daisy Cooper, who, of course, is the deputy leader of the Lib Dems. She said this, Tory Lee Anderson trying to score political points over the horizon scandal at PMQs is beneath even his low standards. Everyone can see this for what it is. An attempt by the Tories to distract from their own terrible failures. Lee, of course, has nibbled back, <laughs> saying, and yet certain people are just waiting to take Sir Ed's job. Ring any bells. Well, she's got a point, frankly. Daisy, Daisy has that. I mean, she yes, of course, it's it's not. Try, it, I think all politicians are panicking mm. about where the blame might lie. They're they're trying to point fingers at Ed Davey. Of course, mm. he ran the show in the post office at Minister 2010 to 2012. The, since then, there've been Tories in those those posts. What were they doing? So I think Daisy Cooper can say that. Lee Anson can say that. But I think people and viewers will see it through it all as politicians panicking about where the finger of blame might point next, frankly. And Chris Ober, I think a lot of people out there will echo your sentiment a, mo a moment ago, a plague on all their houses. Chris Ope, thank you very much. Always a pleasure. Now, the controversial Rwanda bill is back in the Commons next Tuesday, and Rishi Sunak is braced for yet another Tory revolt, a battle with the right wing of his party, and I would say the left wing too. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here 
for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back, it's 5.25. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Later this hour, we'll look ahead to next week's Commons debate on the Rwanda bill. Just how many Tory MPs are going to revolt and give Rishi Sunak another tough time? Well, Sadiq Khan never tires of telling us that London is the greatest city in the world. And thanks to the mayor, the capital is a world beater. But on this front... London is now the world's slowest city to drive in, thanks to Khan's 20 mile per hour speed limit. It takes more than 37 minutes to drive 10 kilometres, or just over six miles, in central London last year, and Dublin is in second place. Now, that news broke in the same week that Khan extended his free school meals for all kids for another year. The trouble is, those free school meals aren't free at all. They actually cost £140 million for the taxpayers. And while it's emerged that tube drivers want an inflation-busting 12% pay rise, after Khan found the cash to stop this week's tube strikes, the Azalef Union says the mayor has found, quote, the magic money tree, and our members expect to share the fruits. Well, joining me now is former Labour advisor and friend of the show, Paul Richards. Paul, welcome to the show. So, Sadiq Khan, I'm getting a triple whammy, and I note, Paul, even the Evening Standard in London, normally Sadiq Khan's almost fan sheet, very, very critical of the aversion of strike action, 30 million quid to stop the tube strikes, and now has left demanding even more. Is this a taste? of what could come under a Labour government? And is it proof that Sadiq Khan is bowing to the unions? Well, it's a taste of the fact it's a general uh, election year and it's a London election year and everything's heating up. I mean, first of all, it would have cost London about 50 million quid if the strikes had gone ahead just in the hospitality sector. Um, never mind all the other businesses that rely on the transport system working. So should, first of all, we should be applauding the mayor for keeping the city working this week and to avoid a crippling strike. So well done on that front. Uh, putting food in the bellies of kids, we all know that means they learn more, they have better life chances. Um, and uh, it helps them get to school on time as well in a week when we learn that there are millions of kids gone missing from school. So that's a good thing. Also, um, these are things that are being wrapped up as successes for the Labour mayor, I would argue. Well, but there's no such thing as a free lunch, although well, that didn't stop Jamie Oliver uh, rushing to applaud Sadiq Khan yesterday, because the fact of the matter is these free lunches cost London taxpayers £140 million. I thought the, con the capital was broke. No doubt people would welcome, well, for example, many more police officers. They're free at the point of need, aren't they? they I mean, the kids don't pay for them. Um, same as the NHS, it, it's not free in the sense that there's no money involved, but it's it's free to those that are getting the service when they need it. And I guess the fact that it's capital wide, every kid gets it, I think is a really good thing because we all know that you know a, a child that is hungry cannot learn and is badly behaved and disrupts classes, and the kids that are well fed are there on time and are more likely to have a good day at school. Yes, we would also like more police on the streets too. I mean, that's you know that's not the same argument though, is it? Well, it is, because, because uh, Sadiq Khan is the, de is the de facto police and crime commissioner for London. We have a terrible problem with knife crime in London. It's, it's the number one thing people talk about to me all the time. And yet no money seems to come from Khan for that. And I put it to you uh, again. The neediest and the poorest children in London already get free school meals, and that's the correct thing to do. My missus is a teacher. Many parents don't need free school meals. But Khan's plan gives it away to all parents, including middle-class parents who can afford meals. And 
And my point is, that is picked up by the taxpayer. There is no such thing as a free lunch. I suppose the point there would be that it reduces the stigma of, of being on free school meals. Uh, you know, for people, even grown-ups can remember that stigma of being marked out as a poor kid that couldn't afford their own food. If you give it to everybody, everyone's in the same boat. They can all sit together. You know, the great thing about London is that different social classes mix in the schools, you know, people from rich backgrounds, poor backgrounds. And uh, removing that stigma, I think, is a, a really positive thing, as well as all the other outcomes that are positive, like I say, about better learning and better behaviour and timekeeping as well. So it's a positive thing. That's why other countries and other cities within the UK are looking at this as being a really positive idea. You know, not something to be poo pooed, but actually something to be emulated and copied. So, you know, let's okay. give them a pat on the back. Uh, okay, Paul, something that's not to be emulated or copied, something that is to be poo pooed, surely you'd have to agree. London is now the world's slowest city. No, no thanks um, in part to low traffic neighbourhoods, endless 20 mile an hour limits. You get nicked for doing 22, an immediate fine. Low traffic neighbourhoods, endless bus lanes, speed cameras, ultra low emission zones, and um, just areas that are just slowing London down to a walking pace. That's not the sign of a progressive city, that's a sign of a city going back to the Victorian era. Well, it, the, the numbers relate to driving cars around London, and it is pretty horrific. I get lots of black cabs. I'm a great supporter of the great black cab trade in London, and I hear the complaints every day that I do that. But there are lots of alternatives to that. And, uh, you know, most of the city is very, very walkable. Um, and, you know, the great thing about London is that you don't need to go on the tube or even the bus. You can walk between some, most of the places you need to get to, certainly in the centre. Secondly, we have a pretty good bus system and it's the cheapest in the UK. You go out of London, people can't believe how much the buses are. Uh, so, what is it, 175, I think, on a London bus now? So, you know, that's pretty good value. We've got the river um, and the tube is unbelievably efficient. You know, I know we get frustrated when it's delayed, but, you know, we stand there and the next one is in three minutes' time. We think, that's a long time to wait go to other countries you know it's a lot lot worse so we should count okay. our blessings and we should get out of our cars is the answer okay paul richards if only said he can't we're going to have his three hundred thousand pound land rover and onto public transport thanks for joining us on the show paul richards always a pleasure now there's lots more still to come between now and six o'clock i'll discuss stephen fry's claim that the caps worn by the king's guards of buckingham palace should be made from fake fur but first your latest news headlines with polly middlehurst Thanks, Martin. The top story is this hour. Post office workers caught up in the Horizon IT scandal will have their convictions overturned by signing to their innocence on a single document. Postal Services Minister Kevin Hollenrake said today the new emergency legislation to exonerate the workers may take weeks, but insists it is a government priority. There'll also be an upfront compensation payment of £75,000 to compensate them for being pilloried, jailed or bankrupted as a result of flawed computer software which wrongly indicated they'd been stealing post office money. VJ Parrick was one of the victims of the scandal. He said those responsible must be held accountable. All the people who are involved in this get the same treatment we have had, all the uh, convicted uh, postmasters, and let them feel how we felt. We've done nothing and we've been in prison. They have done something, so they need to be in prison for the reason what they've done. The Defence Secretary says the UK has helped fight off the largest ever attack by Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in international shipping lanes. Overnight, the Royal Navy's destroyer, HMS Diamond, supported by the United States military, successfully destroyed multiple attack drones swarming over container shipping in the Red Sea. Grant Shapp said the attacks were completely unacceptable and warned there would be further consequences. Yemeni militants have been targeting commercial shipping in support of Hamas, and its war with Israel. The estimated cost of building HS2 between London and Birmingham has soared to as much as 66.6 billion pounds. The chairman of the project told MPs the increase is due to original estimates being too low, poor delivery standards and inflation. In 2013, HS2 was estimated to cost £37.5 billion for the entire planned network, which included the now scrapped sections from Birmingham to Manchester and Leeds. Those are the headlines. More detail on all those stories by heading to our website, gbnews.com.
For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. A quick snapshot for you of today's markets and the pound buying you 1.2727 dollars, that is, and 1.1608 euros. The price of gold is 1,593 pounds and 36 pence an ounce. And the FTSE 100 has closed the day today at 7,651 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Polly. And joining me now once again for my favourite part of the show, and I really do mean it, it's Michelle Jubri, of course, Jubes and Co. coming up after this six or seven. Jubes, what's on your menu? Hello, of course. We, how can we not? We are, uh, of course, looking at the post office horizon scandal and that latest development there, whether or not it's the right step forward. Is it a little bit too little? I've been looking at some of the sub postmasters' uh, reactions to that. I found that very interesting. Also, as well, the 10 most depressing towns uh, have been named. So I'm really interested to see uh, if any of my viewers live in the places mentioned or do they live in a really depressing town that they think should be on the list but it didn't quite make the grade and really importantly I want to debate how on earth do you kind of turn those kind of towns around I also as well Martin I want to ask about free school meals that he can of course uh, has rolled it out uh, across London Jamie Oliver he's piped up now he says that whole scheme should be rolled out nationwide and last but not least I want to ask why um, a rural voters now seemingly uh, turning to Labour. What's going on there? Yeah, Jubes, you know, this free school meal thing, it's kind of really got me going because there's no such thing as a free lunch. You think that, um, Jay, that Jamie Oliver might understand that. It's actually 140 million quid. That's paid for by London taxpayers and London's poorest kids. My missus is a teacher. They already get free school meals and that's a good thing. Do you think this is just con buying votes? We'll have to wait for uh, Jubes and Co. And I'll tell you exactly what I think to that. Uh, and Uncle Asa Mog as well, she's joining me, as is Matthew Stadlin. So we've got lots of different opinions on this one. But I do find it quite interesting. If somebody is wealthy, and let's face it, they can afford uh, to feed their own kids, should people that are on lower incomes, not as wealthy, have to pay for that meal? Because like you say, there is literally no such thing as a free lunch, Martin. Superb. A tasty menu, tasty treats coming up on Jubes Go. I think it should be a parent's job to feed your kids unless you really need it. And don't rely on the state. That's just me, Jubes and Co. and her panel. No doubt we'll have much more to say. Yeah. Superb. That's coming up straight after this 6pm. See you soon. Now, the supermarket chain Morrison's has unveiled a new weapon to fight the shoplifting epidemic. It's called Robocop Cameras. They're designed to stop people nicking expensive booze. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code, or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK. Here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. 
Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 5.41. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, it's one of those classic London images, the sight of the King's Guard wearing magnificent bearskin caps while guarding Buckingham Palace. But now there are renewed calls for them to stop using real fur. The actor and writer Stephen Fry has backed a campaign by animal rights group PETA. The film says bears are mercilessly killed by trophy hunters and is calling for fake fur to be used instead. And to discuss this, I'm now joined by Jennifer White from PISA, who is calling for that ban. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Um, it's a fantastic British tradition, a noble and long-standing one for hundreds of years, the bearskin hat guarding the palace. Tell us why you think that tradition should come to an end. Well, the investigation footage speaks for itself. It's so disturbing. You're seeing bears being shot, disemboweled and dismembered by Canadian hunters, um, which of course, you know, is the, the origin of these bearskin caps. And the footage shows these bears being baited by hunters with cookies and bagels. And then these poor unsuspecting animals are shot, sometimes with crossbows, which are actually illegal here in the UK. And then we know that these pelts often end up at auction houses where the cap makers buy the fur to make these ceremonial caps. And it's just absolutely unacceptable that the British government is supporting the slaughter of black bears when we know that there is a humane, viable faux fur alternative ready to be rolled out. Um, some of the defences for this is that the bear skin can't be replicated in fake fur. It keeps its shape superbly well, a fake fur alternative doesn't do that. It's waterproof, it's warm, it's close-fitting. However, similar moves have been made against leopard skin. Of course, it was used by drummers and now there is no real leopard skin. Do you think the winds of change are on your side and we will see a ban? Absolutely. We will get there. The tide is definitely turning. We know that the British public has turned their back on fur with 95% of them rejecting it. And the claims that the faux fur cap isn't meeting the standards is just complete nonsense because the Ministry of Defence hasn't even seen so much as a faux fur sample. But the faux fur has been independently tested at an MOD accredited laboratory and it actually showed that it outperformed the real bear fur. And of course, the aesthetic of the cap is going 
to be absolutely identical to the original. And we need to remember that this is a ceremonial headdress. Mm. It's interesting because um, Stephen Fry said tradition is never an excuse for cruelty, and a few would disagree with that. But it is a cherished part of the fabric. It's an iconic piece of headwear. What do you say to people who say, you know, you're just poking your nose and looking for trouble, go and bark up a different tree? Well, I'd first tell them to watch the investigation, um, but the look of the cat will remain that traditional, um, iconic look that the cats have, but the material itself is irrelevant. And we know that the faux fur alternative is waterproof. It's the exact same length as bare fur. It's water resistant, and it's also lighter, which actually enhances the user experience for the guards because the current fur is incredibly heavy, which is why we see so many of them fainting when there's a heat wave. OK, Jennifer White from Peter, thank you for giving us food for thought. Bare skin hats, should they be a thing of the past? Now, Rishi Sunak is braced for a common showdown over his Rwanda plan once again after being warned by Tory MPs that the proposal will not work unless it is significantly beefed up. A large number of right-wing Tories are backing amendments to the bill aimed at effectively ignoring international law. And Robert Jenrick, who quit as immigration minister over the bill, if you recall, has warned that the plan simply doesn't work in its current form. Well, joining me now is former Conservative MP and leader of the UKIP party, Neil Hamilton. Neil, thank you for joining us on the show. Always a pleasure. Here we are again. It's like Brexit all over again. Groundhog Day on Rwanda. The right think it's too weak. The left think it's too strong. Never the twain shall meet. Will this bill ever get through? Well, of course, um, the right are absolutely correct. This bill simply can't work because Sunak is apparently allergic to leaving the European Convention on Human Rights and the UN Refugee Convention. And uh, the amendments which are going to be put down to this bill will not actually make it workable, uh, because you can't, by means of a bill in the House of Commons, actually leave the ECHR or the UN Refugee Convention, that, because they're treaties, and the government has formally to denounce them, is the technical term, which they're not going to do. Uh, so this is a dead cat distraction, actually. We know that the bill's not going to work. There's less than 12 months of, of this uh, hopeless government left, and Sunak knows that. Uh, this is a distraction from the real issue, which is uncontrolled mass immigration, legal immigration, as much as and even more so than illegal immigration. Uh, and uh, whilst we're talking about Rwanda, we're not talking about what really matters. You know, 750,000 people added to our population last year through migration alone, and those are the ones we know about. And uh, we know there are lots more that we don't know about. So, uh, you know, I'm sa sadly, you know, th th this is yet a, another dead duck as well as a dead cat bill. And uh, again, Neil, with echoes of Brexit, do you think any attempts to beef this up will, will surely fall down in the Lords and then the courts? Well, of course. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the clauses in the bill gives migrants a right to seek an exception from the, the, uh, the, the main purpose of the bill. So, of course, hundreds of thousands of people uh, potentially could take advantage of those. And we've got a court system which is completely clogged at the minute. Like everything else in this country, the courts don't work as they should do. Um, the whole public sector seems to be in meltdown. Uh, and uh, so the system will just clog up uh, and the Sunak and uh, his unlamented Tory government will be long gone before... Uh, any of these cases is actually heard. And Neil, we've seen hundreds of millions of pounds thrown at this scheme already. Do you think we'll see a single flight leaving the UK for Rwanda before a general election? Well, I hope so. I think I'd like to put most of the House of Commons on it. And uh, then we might uh, start to make some progress. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that is a novel solution. I think a lot of people would probably like that. They would like the idea of just putting all the politicians on a flight and, and, and try, trying to let this, the sort of grown-ups, if you like, run the country. Is this a sign, well, not a uh, Neil? <laughs> I'm sure people would like it. Is this a sign, though, Neil, back to Brexit, and briefly, if we could, of a, of a party totally divided on immigration, totally divided on Rwanda, just like it was with Brexit. And therefore, we need a hard reset. We need a, a cruel reckoning at the general elections to try and get the party back to basics. 
Well, there are probably 60 or 70 Tory MPs in Parliament. The rest of them are just Social Democrats. Uh, this is as a result of Cameron uh, wrecking the candidate selection pro procedure uh, in the Tory party because uh, he, he wanted more people like him who don't have any recognisable political views, uh, but they just want to climb the greasy pole of politics and uh, uh, have the ministerial cars and hobnob with other like-minded individuals at uh, international panjandrums around the world, whilst actually betraying the interests of the British people. And just as Cameron uh, fought tooth and nail to avoid having a referendum until he was forced into having one, and then fought as hard as he possibly could to uh, win the referendum campaign, uh, they are, are doing exactly the same on immigration. They never had the slightest intention of controlling migration. Boris Johnson, after all, wanted, when he was mayor of London, to have an amnesty for illegal immigrants. And he himself relaxed the, uh, re the qualifications for income and so on uh, if, to get uh, work visas uh, in, when he was prime minister. Uh, and so that has led to the ballooning of the migration statistics that we've seen in the last couple of years. You know, we've added 1.3 million people to our population in two years. That's a city the size of Birmingham added to our population every two years. You know, okay. we've got to wise up here. OK, superb. We're going to have to leave it there. Um, Neil Hamilton, leader of the UKIP party. UKIP, indeed, fantastic. Thanks for joining us on the show. It's always a pleasure. Now, we've often talked about the police failing to take shoplifting seriously, but now the supermarket chain Morrisons is doing something about it themselves. And it's this. It's using Robocop cameras in aisles to stop customers from stealing. Well, I'm joined now by former Mets detective Peter Blexley, who joins us on the show. Peter, this is an astonishing story. It follows, of course, earlier this year. The co-op group was saying that eight out of ten calls to the old bill for shoplifting aren't even answered. And now these whopping great cameras have been put by the booze aisles to film people caught in the act. Is this a sign, a symptom of the fact that shoplifting is now basically legal? Yes, unfortunately, we are in the midst of a shoplifting epidemic. And these cameras which have previously been used overnight on building sites and the such like to stop people breaking in and taking valuable uh, equipment used in the building of houses and factories. They're now being deployed by Morrisons in the booze aisle. And quite frankly, I do not criticise them for that, although there is a lot more they themselves could be doing. I've got some concerns. If these... Uh, video cameras, these robotic cameras, spot somebody stealing something, it can let out a siren noise which goes up to 120 decibels. Now, I'd be concerned for elderly people who were perhaps shopping, might be holding a bottle of wine or whiskey and looking at it, contemplating buying it. All of a sudden, a huge great siren goes off, deafening a bottle of alcohol gets dropped on the floor and broken, are Morrison's going to be any better off? Yeah, I mean, certainly if 120 decibels blew off in my Legol, Peter, I'd probably fancy a stiff drink after that. But joking aside, um, supermarkets increasingly um, are having to take action themselves, aren't they? And it's this kind of downgrading of crime, what police will call low-grade crime. But, Peter, you know better than anybody, these so-called low-grade crimes really affect people's quality of life. Oh, they do. And let's look at other crimes that the police have dismissively called low level. Theft of a phone, theft of a bicycle, theft of a car, a house being burgled, some uh, shoplifting, of course, and somebody becoming a victim of fraud. And there are millions of those victims every year. The police have essentially turned their backs on victims of those types of crimes, and they've realised that they've become utterly irrelevant to millions of victims of crime. And therefore, they do not command the respect of victims of crime, especially because they almost subcontract the investigating of those offences back out to the victims, which is deeply offensive. In other words, do you know who did it? Have you got CCTV? Any chance of forensics at your house? Well, why don't you, the police, turn up and find out? So the police respect has tanked, and of course, so has trust and confidence, which are the words the police keep using. There is a very kind of simplistic way in which this epidemic of shoplifting could be tackled. Four kind of factors to it. Number one, the retailers. Train your security staff 
in restraint techniques and self-defense. And if need be, give them cable ties or handcuffs. That's the first thing. And ditch any non-intervention policy. Get them catching these people. Get them detaining them. Number two, the police could turn up. That would be really yeah. helpful. Helpful and arrest Peter, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to interject there. You're only halfway through your monologue, but we simply run out of time. I've been Martin Daubney. After the break, Jubes and Co. I'll see you tomorrow, 3 till 6. Cheers. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Hello again, it's Aidan McKibben here from the Met Office with the GB News forecast. It's feeling cold out there today. There are some sunny skies around, but otherwise a lot of cloud is covering the country, especially across northeastern parts. High pressure currently driving east to northeasterly winds in across the UK. Feeling cold in that wind despite the sunshine in the south and a lot of cloud elsewhere will bring some spots of rain and drizzle to Wales, northern and eastern England, southern Scotland. That will tend to fade through the night. Clear skies in the south will lead to a frost in many places, although there will be some patchy cloud cover developing. Minus one to minus two Celsius in the south. A frost also likely for western Scotland under clear spells. But elsewhere where we've got the cloud, it's going to be a frost-free start to Thursday. Temperatures of 4 to 6 Celsius across East Wales into the Midlands, eastern England, southern and eastern Scotland. We've got less of a wind on Thursday, so perhaps not feeling quite as cold in the south. We've got a sunny start in the south, but increasingly the cloud builds from the northeast, keeping the sunshine towards the far southwest, increasing sunshine across central and western Scotland. Otherwise, a lot of cloud, but fewer showers around compared with today. Into Friday, a frosty start for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Clear skies here, generally cloudy elsewhere. And into the weekend, a big change in the weather comes along as Arctic winds arrive with snow showers for Scotland. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily. To find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster. And why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. 
Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Hello there, good evening to you. It's six o'clock, I'm Michelle Jubri, and this is Jubes & Co. Coming up tonight, Rishi Sunak has made a massive announcement today when it comes to the post office scandal. A new, a new law will basically quash the convictions for hundreds of sub-purse masters whose lives were absolutely wrecked. So I'm asking, yes, fantastic, it's a great move, but is it enough? And how has it actually been received? What else? needs to happen. And also tonight, a new poll is highlighting the UK's, and I quote, most soul-destroying towns, places that apparently are home to bland, boring, soul-destroying, mediocrity with a gaping cultural void. Blimey, is your town on this list? We'll take a look, but I'm asking crucially, how on earth do you think we turn towns such as this around what does it take also a new poll shows that rural voters seem to be switching to labor what's causing that and is the blue wall crumbling and last but not least Sadiq Khan he has just confirmed is going to roll out free school meals for all primary schools